Coming up next, the House Natural Resources Subcommittee convenes to examine the National Acid Precipitation Assessment Program and the question of whether the program is accomplishing its goals as set forth by Congress in 1980. Subcommittee Chairman James Scheuer of New York spoke to us about the hearing afterwards. He talked about the interim report compiled by the program's previous director. This report was supposed to provide a full assessment of the acid rain problem to Congress and the President. The Congressman also explained why he had convened the hearing at this time. Well, there were a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, Dr. Mahoney is the new director of NAPAP, the National Acid uh, Rain Precipitation uh, Group. Uh, he's only come on in the last couple of weeks, but he has been involved in their interagency scientific committee for uh, about six years, since 1982. So he's very knowledgeable, and he's also very new. Uh, that's the first reason. The second reason is that in the interim report of the National Acid Rain Precipitation Group uh, that was released last year, they had several hundred pages of excellent quality scientific data. But the executive summary of that several hundred pages, who was done by the former director, who has since retired, was grossly inadequate and scientifically unsound. It was a political document. Uh, it was biased. He selected little snips here and driblets there uh, of uh, scientific information. and. Uh, uh, came up with conclusions that no rational man who had looked at the evidence or no rational group who had evaluated the evidence and, and integrated the evidence could possibly have come to. Uh, I mentioned a baker's dozen of uh, incidents where the uh, report was dishonest, intellectually dishonest, misleading, confusing, uh, duplicitous. And if you think this is strong prose, you should read the prose that the General Accounting Office and the Library of Congress, normally two cool and calm government agencies, you should see the, the uh, turgid uh, purple prose that they used to describe uh, that 35-page uh, executive summary that the former director seemingly went into the attic on his own, drafted himself without any peer review, without any... Uh, dis any real discussion, any real input from his own interagency scientific review committee. Uh, it was very poor science. It was not a credit to any of the agencies involved. And of course they're not to be blamed. They had nothing to do with that, uh, with that uh, executive summary. And uh, I must say I was very encouraged by Dr. Mahoney's testimony this morning. Uh, he was in a very uncomfortable situation. It was perfectly clear uh, that he felt awkward and embarrassed in answering questions about that executive summary. Uh, the entire scientific community has indicated its outrage. And it was perfectly clear that uh, he's an honorable man, is thoroughly familiar with the material, and he was doing two things. First, he was assuring us that the process is going to change. The system is going to change. So that when they issue their report in 1990, it will be uh, subject to uh, the fresh breezes of, of scientific review and, and public comment. It will not be a private in-house document that has been shielded uh, from any examination by uh, the peer review process or by public comment. So the process is going to be vastly improved according to him. And the second thing he indicated was a willingness to recast and redo and reevaluate that executive summary, both from the point of view of new information that has accrued in the 18 months since it was written, and uh, from the point of view of the uh, serious reservations that I and my colleagues and the scientific community in general have on at least a dozen elements in that uh, executive summary that we feel were misleading, were dishonest, uh, mischievous, confusing, and that is part of a political attempt to politicize the scientific research process and uh, defuse it, rob it of its meaning, of the uh, over a third of a billion dollars that we spent on scientific research and deny the policymakers here on the Hill 
and in the executive branch at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, deny them the data and the, the scientific data, raw data, and the scientific value judgments, uh, the cost, cost appraisals of the cost of pollution controls, benefit data on what, what benefits we can expect in minimizing pollution as a result of these expenditures. Uh, 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 pu public policy makers like myself and my colleagues urgently need this and the executive summary should have given us some guidance and direction and uh, uh, it, it, it was very frustrating to see it uh, uh, frustrate that very purpose by its real intellectual dishonesty and Dr. Mahoney has promised to review that true in the light of new evidence. That's fine. He should include uh, an appraisal of the new evidence, but he, he uh, indicated a real willingness to <clears throat> respond to the criticism from the Hill, criticism from the scientific community at large, criticism from these expert public uh, interest groups, and criticism from his own, uh, from his own members of his interagency scientific committee to respond to that by uh, undoing the errors and the misrepresentations of the past and come up with an honest, forthright report on where we are, what we ought to be doing, the benefits we can uh, expect to receive from uh, given expenditures in remediation, and uh, uh, giving the policymakers here and in the executive branch some real uh, fodder to work with. And I uh, must cons confess that all of us were very much encouraged at Dr. Mahoney's uh, forthcoming, cooperative, honorable attitude. And we look forward to working with him. And we certainly are going to uh, look forward to receiving that report on or uh, shortly after Labor Day, as he promised to uh, uh, present it to us. So what happens now for the subcommittee? Will you be holding further hearings? Well, uh, we certainly will be holding hearings in... Uh, 1990 when that report uh, comes uh, comes through and I suspect that we'll be uh, we'll be uh, following our, our oversight uh, and accountability uh, function uh, in having further hearings and it, it may be that uh, the report that uh, Dr. Mahoney promised to give us after Labor Day will speak for itself and it may make a hearing quite unnecessary, and it may be that uh, a further morning of hearings will be uh, indicated and justified at that time. Great. Dr. James Mahoney, the new director of the National Acid Precipitation Assessment Program, is the first witness. He talked to us about his testimony before the subcommittee. Well, my basic message is that we need to do a very solid job of structuring all of the scientific and technological information we have developed in the last several years to aid the Congress and all of the nation in making sound judgments about acid rain control priorities. Great difficulty is there are so many aspects to the problem and its severity and the approaches to sensible control that we have to get beyond individual statements and put all our information into one context so that we can make sound decisions. So you support this effort by the subcommittee to examine the issue of acid rain? Absolutely. I think it's very important that the, the subcommittee keep this in its view all the time, and it should do this through periodic hearings. The whole context of NAPEP, the National Acid Precipitation Assessment Program, is one that aims at the development of sound technical information and then presentation of that in a structured form back to the Congress and to the nation. Mm -hmm. So based on this hearing today, what will your next step be? Our next step in the program is the development of a written plan which will summarize all of the questions that we intend to pose and answer in the reports that we must deliver under the statute to the Congress in 1990. We expect to have that plan prepared in the next few months and then we will use that as the basis for soliciting public comments. We'll publish it openly for the United States and for Canadian and other foreign reviewers. We will conduct open national meetings to receive comments on that plan and then we'll set about putting all of those comments and our views into a single structuring of our approach to the broad question of acid rain control. Now we take you to the House Natural Resources Subcommittee. Congressman James Scheuer chairs the proceedings.
The Subcommittee on Natural Resources, Agricultural Research and Environment will come to order. Uh, the Subcommittee today examines the management of the National Acid Precipitation Assessment Program, here and after referred to this morning as NAPAP. The Subcommittee uh, authorizes about $65 million of the $85 million uh, uh, currently uh, uh, funded for interagency uh, research through the research programs <coughs> of the EPA, uh, NOAA, the National Atmospheric and Oceanic uh, Administration, and the Department of Energy. Now, since 1980, when the National Acid Precipitation Assessment Program, NAPAP, uh, was created, we have spent over a third of a billion dollars studying acid rain. Yet with only two years remaining in uh, NAPAP's life, uh, there are very serious <coughs> questions out there as to whether NAPAP is fulfilling the mission for which it was created, namely to provide a scientifically credible, technologically sound, and technically sound assessment of the acid rain program that can be used by Congress and the President to make some tough, agonizingly complicated decisions on acid rain. <clears throat> a review of recent events makes this uh, hearing particularly timely. A year ago, the Government Accounting Office, the GAO, which is Congress's traditional investigating arm, re released a report that can be only described as scathing on the NAPAP program, which was then under the direction of Dr. Lawrence Culp. The GAO found, among other things, that Dr. Culp had failed to issue any of the, report, of the reports required by law for the first 17 months of his tenure. The 1985 assessment, which had been billed as the most significant document to date uh, from the acid rain research program, was two years late. And key research areas were cut back, making it unlikely, very unlikely, that key information uh, that was supposed to be d provided to Congress under the NAPAP plan would be provided to Congress by 1990 which is the final report of NAPAP. In September 1987, NAPAP finally released its interim assessment to a literal, literally to a firestorm of uh, criticism. Uh, critics charged that the 35-page executive summary authored by Dr. Culp personally uh, distorted and misrepresented the findings contained in the voluminous research documents of several hundred pages attached to the summary. One week after the interim assessment was released, Dr. Culp resigned. Today, uh, the subcommittee is pleased to welcome Dr. Culp's successor, Dr. James Mahoney, who was appointed to the post only several weeks ago. Although he has served on, on, on the task force, since 1982 and presumably is thoroughly familiar with all of the goings on which we will be discussing with him. Uh, we look forward to uh, discussing with him and the members of the Interagency Scientific Committee who are accompanying him several key issues. We will be discussing the findings of the interim assessment. We will be discussing the plans for producing the final assessment due in 1990. We'll be discussing the scientific uncertainties which are likely to be unresolved by 1990. And we'll be discussing with uh, him and his colleagues plans for research after NAPAP's charter expires in 1990. In the light of recent events, I'm particularly concerned about the conclusion of the General Accounting Office that it's unclear whether NAPAP will be able to meet its goal of obtaining and analyzing research to be used as a basis for policy decisions by 1990. We want to know what we can realistically expect from the NAPAP program by 1990. We've spent far too much money and far too much time 
for we don't know to be a viable or an acceptable answer. We welcome the witnesses today and look forward to their testimony. <coughs> may I uh, may I recognize our ranking uh, minority member, Claudine Schneider of Rhode Island. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, scheduling of this hearing has turned out to be quite fortuitous, seeing as how the President and the Prime Minister of Canada will be meeting today to discuss issues of mutual concern, including acid rain. Two years ago, these two great leaders came together and they endorsed the conclusions of this report here, which was uh, jointly prepared by special envoys from our two countries. And this study stated that acid rain is a serious environmental problem in both the United States and Canada. Well, evidence continues to mount that this conclusion was correct and is correct. And this week, the Environmental Defense Fund released yet another report about the role of acid rain. And they linked environmental damage along the Atlantic coast, such as eutrophication and algae bloom, to acid rain. Now, I think it's important to recognize that since the release of the Special Envoy's report two years ago, regrettably this administration has done little to indicate that it does in fact view acid rain as a very serious problem and that it intends to correct this problem. And the most recent disappointment has been their handling of the interim report of the National Acid Precipitation Assessment Program, NAPAP as we affectionately refer to it. The um, executive summary of this report especially is especially criticized for bending science into, and I quote, non-action political agenda. These criticisms have been levied not only by the outside witnesses that we're going to be hearing from this morning, but also by many of their eminent colleagues that uh, work diligently in this field. Once the NAPAC process is complete in just two years, in 1990, the question that we will need to ask is, what have we gotten out of this? After 10 years and nearly half a billion dollars, the answer will be, we have gotten a lot of facts and very little action in controlling acid rain. As we examine the future of this program after 1990, we should seriously consider broadening its mission to include other pressing air quality issues. For example, last year in a report issued by EPA, they call, which was entitled Unfinished Business, it was very clearly stated that indoor air pollution was listed as a leading priority for this agency. As we are encountering the prevalency of radon and other indoor air pollutants, I think that it is critical that we recognize that when we discuss the air and when we discuss unfinished business, this all has to be incorporated into a comprehensive priority action agenda. I welcome the opportunity that this hearing provides us with to weigh all of these issues, and I look forward to seeing the final NAPAP report and ver working very closely with the administration on future air quality needs, particularly in so far as our action agenda is concerned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Schneider. Uh, Congressman Tim Valentine of North Carolina. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for recognizing me. I don't have any opening uh, statement, but I ask uh, unanimous consent to uh, insert a statement into the record. Uh, there being no objection, so ordered. Uh, Congressman Bob Smith of New Hampshire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you also for uh, holding this uh, very timely hearing. I do ask uh, unanimous consent to insert a statement in the record. Um, there being no objection, so ordered. And just quickly before starting would point out that uh, I intend to be uh, questioning uh, as uh, perhaps uh, intensely as some of my colleagues on the uh, NAPAP report. Uh, I think though as we do this uh, over the next hour or two we all ought to keep in mind that uh, I think there's enough blame to go around as to why we don't have uh, acid rain control legislation at this point. Uh, certainly uh, the President uh, as we see in the front page of the Washington Post this morning, where the U.S. demands a higher limit on acid rain uh, ingredient. Uh, I find this uh, quite shocking uh, and a little bit uh, disgusting, quite frankly, uh, that now we're going to, in Geneva, we're negotiating international pollution agreement demanding a right for the United States to emit 20 percent more of uh, nitrous oxide. I, I don't understand uh, how we can really look the Canadians in the face with this type of attitude, 
but apparently we are able to do that. Uh, but secondly, I want to point out, uh, and, and, and finally, by the way, uh, that there is plenty of blame to go around on this issue in the United States House of Representatives. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, I, I'm not being political because I've taken on my own president on it publicly, privately for the last four years. Uh, but I also feel that um, the legislation must begin in the United States Congress, and we don't have it, and we all know whose doorstep that falls on. It falls on Senator Byrd in the Senate, and it falls on John Dingell in the House of Representatives. Let's call it where it is. Uh, we cannot get acid rain legislation out of this place without those two gentlemen, and uh, we need them, and, and we need to have some people uh, with influence in this Congress to start moving to do just that. Uh, and I just would finally say from a personal standpoint, on the NOAA authorization bill, I included a couple of lines of an amendment which was passed unanimously by the House, which simply provided that acid rain uh, pH content be reported or be sent to the weather uh, stations. Not, not that it be reported even, just that it be sent to them. And that authorization is being bottled up in the U.S. Senate by Senator Byrd simply because of that language. And I've been pressured to remove that language. And I'm not going to remove that language. And I think that what, what, uh, what we've got to understand here is that this is not, although I'm going to be critical of this NAPAP report, I'm not going to stand for just simply having it be just the uh, Reagan administration because the fault also lies with this Congress. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, you could have quoted Shakespeare to us this morning, Congressman. <laughs> the fault, dear Brutus, lies not in the stars, but in ourselves. Right. And you're absolutely right. You're, uh, you hit the nail on the head. It's unfortunate that we have two uh, committee chairmen in the House and the Senate who come from uh, Michigan and, and West Virginia, two of the most uh, polluting states in, in the nation. Uh, Michigan uh, generating cars and, and uh, West Virginia generating soft coal. And uh, <clears throat> that is a real problem and it has been, had a crippling and disabling effect on Congress's meeting its, uh, uh, the challenge of facing up to acid rain in an adequate fashion. And combined with the administration's uh, do-nothing attitude uh, and the their attitude that we should engage in research for the sake of research as a substitution for action, uh, we are in the present pitiful condition of uh, doing nothing in the face of mounting evidence that we ought to be doing something. I couldn't agree with my colleague more, and as far as our uh, relations with the, our Canadian friends ought to, uh, are concerned, uh, we ought to be embarrassed to look them in the face. I remember President Reagan's first official uh, act in terms of foreign affairs was to greet the Prime Minister of Canada in January or February of 1981. And he promised at that time, he committed himself at that time that we were going to do something about acid rain. And the p performance of the President and the performance of the Congress, as you say, have been equally pitiful and shameful in the ensuing years. Uh, I'd like to yield to my colleague Tim Valentine. Uh, excuse me, of Tom, uh, Tom McMillan of Maryland. Mr. Chairman, I uh, just want to say briefly that I commend you for holding these timely hearings and take a closer look at the process of uh, eutrophication, which has a major effect on the Chesapeake Bay, uh, uh, an estuary that is of vital importance not only to my district in the state of Maryland, but to our country at large. And I'm looking forward to these hearings with great anticipation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, con my colleague. Uh, few states have, have as critical a problem of acid rain as does the state of Maryland, and uh, few states have as active and uh, knowledgeable and, and effective members concerned about this problem as Maryland. Uh, Congressman George Hochbruckner of my state of New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I also would like to commend you for holding uh, these hearings and uh, I would like to say from my own perspective, coming from an engineering background, that I think there are some great opportunities in the area of clean coal technology which can uh, help solve the problem and at the same time uh, meet the uh, political concerns that obviously have uh, uh, affected uh, the inaction that has occurred by Congress. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. We'll now, uh, 
We'll now ask uh, Dr. James Mahoney and uh, his colleagues from the uh, National Acid Precipitation Assessment Program uh, to uh, come to the witness table. I believe Mr. Dr. Mahoney will be accompanied by members of the NAPAP Interagency Science Committee. Dr. George Jordy from the Department of Energy. Dr. Charles Philpot, Department of Agriculture. Dr. Jack Pickering, Department of the Interior. Dr. Courtney Reardon, EPA. Dr. Lester Mokta, NOAA. Uh, and Dr. James Morris, the Tennessee Valley Administration. If you'd all come forward and join us at the witness table, we'll commence the hearing. All right, gentlemen, we're very happy to have you here this morning. This should be a very interesting uh, hearing. You've heard something of the concerns of the members of this subcommittee, Dr. Mahoney. Uh, I hope you'll address them in the course of your uh, testimony. Why don't you take 10 or 12 minutes or such time as you may need. You're the key witness here this morning. And uh, tell us about uh, uh, the history of uh, NAPAP, where we are, where we're headed, and perhaps addressing some of the concerns that you've, that you've heard here in the last half hour. Mr. Please, pre Mr. Chairman, yes, before indeed. our uh, first witness begins, let me apologize in saying that I have a markup before my other committee on the Alaska uh, National Wildlife Area, so I will have to duck out. But I uh, thank you for bringing together such an illustrious uh, series of witnesses, and I will try to be back later in the morning. Very good. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try and accommodate you on your questioning. Okay, Dr. Mahoney, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I start, I would like to uh, mention that we have one substitution of name. Uh, Dr. William Summers is here instead of Dr. Philpot, representing the Department of Agriculture. And I'd like to have that noted for the record. All right. I wish we could note it on our card up there. Uh, Maybe we can get that. Dr. William Summers. All right, please proceed. He's from okay, where? Next <laughs> okay. And also, Mr. Chairman, as I begin, I'd like to simply respond to Ms. Schneider by uh, pointing out I would be most pleased to answer questions in or outside the context of this hearing if it happens you're not able to be back, and I look forward to the chance. Yes, we will, uh, we will hold the, uh, the, the minutes open uh, for written questions if... Uh, Congresswoman Schneider or any of my colleagues wish to submit them and uh, give you an, uh, give you 10 days or 10 days Sorry. or two weeks to answer them. But uh, when Madam Schneider comes back, uh, we'll give her a chance to ask okay. her questions out of turn. Okay, okay, please proceed. Very good. And with that, I want to thank you indeed very much for your invitation to appear here before the subcommittee today and to review the status and the plans for NAPAP. I undertook the position of director of NAPAP on March 1st, and since that time I have attempted to review the entire program, noting the many scientific accomplishments of the program, as well as the many concerns which have been expressed and which you have summarized, in fact, in your opening statement this morning. Based upon my review, I would like to begin my testimony by outlining the two points of general strategy which we are developing to make the most effective use of the scientific information and the technological information developed by NAPAP. First of these two points, a high quality program of research has been and is being conducted by NAPAP. By 1990, we will have a much greater base of information to assist in decision making about acid deposition than we do now, and I might say even more than we did a few years ago. Our first point of strategy, therefore, is that we will continue careful management and scientific peer review of the research activities underway. We will make changes in emphasis and direction as necessary, but we will keep the overall research program on its current course. Second, and my two points of strategy, 
the organization and the reporting of the technical information developed for assessment purposes needs extensive development and structuring to allow full use of the research findings. Several changes in our assessment methodology are already underway, including greater involvement in structuring the questions to be addressed by the user community. We intend to involve all of those who would use the information in the process of defining what it is specifically we will address and how we will address it. And when we view that user community for this assessment, our list includes, at the minimum, you all in the Congress and your staff, the various federal and state agencies, the various agencies at the provincial and national government level in Canada, and other foreign agencies, all of the environmental groups, the industry groups, and the scientific community itself, which has a stake in seeing good science done for good public purpose in this case. We aim to provide a very useful integrated assessment in 1990, and I might note that the planned deadline for submission is two and one half years from now. Our deadline is September 30th, 1990. Moreover, we aim to make the process, the interdisciplinary process we are now conducting, a beneficial model for consideration for, the, for dealing with other issues which combine these traits of complex technical analysis and important public policy decisions, such as the broad range of questions we see in the geosphere-biosphere interaction area. Now, in the rest of my statement, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to respond to the questions you posed in your opening statement and in your invitation to me. Uh, first, I want to speak for a moment about the interim assessment document, which you've already discussed. What you Each of the technical chapters in the interim assessment oh, yeah. was reviewed by several external scientific specialists. In total, well, more than uh, excuse 50... Excuse me, excuse me. What was reviewed by the external specialists? Uh, each of the technical chapters, Mr. Chairman, in the interim assessment. You understand that our main complaints don't go to the scientific validity and objectivity and professionalism of the several hundred pages of, of reports. What our concerns run to is the quality of and the methodology involved in the 35-page executive summary. Mr. Chairman, yes, I do indeed, and I, I intend to speak about that. I would note also, though, that there have been many scientific comments raised about the material in the technical chapters. That is in the normal course of doing good science, of course, too. The entire purpose for writing down information is so that those who would want to review it can challenge and discuss. So I was speaking first about the technical chapters in the matter that there is a desired dialogue to be carried out about the technical matters. And then, of course, we need to address the, your specific concern about the executive summary. Excellent. Uh, to, to finish a comment on the technical material first, we, may have to do it before. we plan to invite those scientists who have provided critique, and in most cases written critique, on the technical material in the documents. We plan to invite these individuals to meetings with the NAPAP staff and with, with key NAPAP affiliated scientists so that we can do something which is responsive to our charter as you provided in the original statute. That is to carry out scientific inquiry and carefully examine those scientific questions. Now as to the executive summary, we recognize that the summary, that the critiques of the summary have focused on issues of emphasis and issues of definition and uh, those issues which you've described in your opening statement. We are carefully considering these critiques in developing our plans for the 1990 assessment and we will publish for public comment and review and revision later this year a detailed plan for that final assessment which will include definitions of all of the significant effects being considered under the name of acid rain and explicit questions about their, those effects and their scope and the means of control to be addressed in that document. We will have this available in a few months this year. We will, 
then conduct a national public hearing so that we will have a formal mechanism for receiving written and verbal comments about the entire scope of our plan to define and structure the information that we have to present to the nation in this area. And we will revise then that plan to reflect those comments. We intend to have this updated plan for the 1990 assessment through this process of publication, receipt of review comments, and revision by later this year so that there will be approximately two years remaining for the NAPEP scientific and technological resources to be directed toward answering those questions which we have agreed best define and characterize <coughs> the problem we're dealing with. Now going on with my statement, uh, the next question you raised in the invitation to testify was that about uh, management changes and in particular I presume the matter that I now occupy the position of director. I want to point out, as you noted in your opening statement, that I was an appointee of the president to the oversight task force for NAPAP beginning from 1982. As a result, I have had an opportunity to see NAPAP's operation and structure over all the time between then and the current time. I have to note with reserve that the scope of NAPAP's activities and technical studies is so broad that an uh, an appointee external oversight reviewer is not able to deal with that material in great detail, or at least I could not. Uh, so I have to be careful to note that I'm not in a position to speak with expert, expert view about all of the work carried out in the last five years. Uh, Dr. Mahoney, I take it you can speak with some authority about the content and the adequacy of the 35-page executive summary. I would hope I could, Mr. Chairman. Very yes. good. Now, in the uh, bringing it to the current time in my role as director of the program, I note that the challenge for any new incumbent would be substantial, even if he has had earlier contact with the program. The, for example, the process of achieving adequate scientific perspective about all of NAPAP's activities, which include nearly 300 projects underway right now, would take many months at the, at the least. And Dr. Mahoney, there's a roll call vote going on now. We're going to have to suspend for about 15 minutes to get that. Uh, we can go on for another minute or two before that, or we can do that now. Which would you prefer? Well, if you'd like, Mr. Chairman, in one minute I could uh, conclude my matter on my view of my own role, and then we can come back to specific plans Very going good. forward if you'd Excellent. like. Excellent. I'd simply conclude the comment about my own role coming into the position of director by noting that my own technical experience over many years has been uh, emphasizing the interaction between technical research and public issues and their resolution. So I bring this frame of reference to my view of the position and I wanted to recommend that my goal for NAPAP's 1990 assessment is that it, when it is released, that it view, be viewed as credible by both its users, all of, the, all of those I mentioned before, as well as by the scientific community, which should validate that the work represented is sound. And if you'd like, Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to stop there and then return to plans after your break. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahoney. We will do that, and we will break now for about 15 minutes. Our coverage of this hearing on acid rain will continue in just a few moments. Join us for a new Election 88 program. The first Monday of each month, we'll take a special look at key races throughout the country, the Senate and House races, and the run for governor. A unique view of politics on the state and local level. Monday, May 2nd, beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific Time, on C-SPAN, your campaign headquarters. Up next, we continue our coverage of a hearing before the House Science, Space, and Technology Subcommittee on Natural Resources, Agricultural Research, and the Environment. That panel heard testimony on the National Acid Rain Research Program.
Okay, the committee will continue. Dr. Mahoney, you still have some of your affirmative testimony to finish up. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to proceed and finish this to get on to your question phase promptly. Bye. I do want to move next to respond to your question about our plans for preparing the 1990 assessment. We have adopted a series of guidelines for that assessment, and I'd like to simply state those for the subcommittee at this time. The guidelines are these. The 1990 assessment must first be based on credible scientific information which is available to all of the users of the assessment. It all must be carefully documented. Second, and probably most importantly for the sense of your hearing, the assessment must be developed from a structured plan, which includes a careful definition of all of the effects of acid rain studied, and includes specific questions to be addressed and resolved in the assessment. This plan must be reviewed by all of the identified user groups interested in the assessment, and the plan must be open to modification to include consideration of the comments and suggestions made by that user group. And I might divert from the statement just a moment on this key point to make it clear that we view that the assessment process is something that goes beyond the underlying science. We all understand the role of the scientist is to prepare to do his studies or her studies, develop information, present it, have it carefully reviewed, identify uncertainties, and make it available to any reader or user. In the assessment process, we are challenging our scientific community to structure their information in this very complicated matter, to put the parts together and to lay down a plan about how it will be put together in a way that all of those who want to draw conclusions from this, you all in the Congress in particular, obviously, can see our best effort to so structure it. And we believe you need to see that this year, and we need to work to the plan that you and others interested have seen and commented upon, and then we have adopted with adequate revisions later this year. Now, going on to the other points in our guidelines for the integrated assessment, it must document all of the data used, finally, in drawing conclusions. It must show the quality assurance methods adopted. And remember, with field measurements, the matter of careful quality assurance is always important, else we can give the problem away by poor measurement right at the beginning. And we must also document all the computer models used so that we don't have the models substituting for our judgment through some error or misunderstanding which is not apparent to the subsequent user of the information. And we must document all the uncertainties associated with the assessment process. Now, beginning from these guidelines, we have adopted a series of specific plans, and indeed I have given most of my first two months on the job to this matter of the process so that we can get this started, and then we can go back and look at our science in some more detail. But I have had the chance to carry the recommendations for plans I will now present to the joint chairs responsible for the program and have gotten their approval on the matters I will now uh, describe to you as our specific operating plans for the next two and a half years. First of all, our reports in 1990, and I might add parenthetically, I don't mean we should disappear and not report anything until 1990, but our final reports when the time comes will include two separate but very closely related series of documents. One half of that series will be a careful survey of state of science and state of technology about, that relate to the acid rain question. The other half of the series will be specifically the integrated assessment with our findings and the best recommendations we can make. Both of these series of documents will be prepared by the same team of scientists and engineers to assure that the underlying information conforms to our best view of the science. Obviously, we don't want one group to prepare something and another group to take it away and draw conclusions from it. The integrated assessment summarizing a structured set of findings and recommendations will be based on the information which we carefully document in the state of science and state of technology reports 
and that assessment will be structured around questions which evaluate the extent and the severity of acid deposition effects together with our best views of the means to reduce or mitigate these effects. Next, this state of science summary information will be developed in the form of approximately 20 very high quality survey papers written for the first line specialist audience to give our scientists in the program a chance to take every part of the program and lay out in the best way our views of what we know and what we don't know. And I might note that separating this state of science summary in a sense a half step from the assessment makes sure that our scientists can tell us what they know and can draw conclusions in the best scientific sense citing uncertainties and the like without feeling that they have to look over their shoulder about whether the what they're saying for that purpose is somehow a recommendation about what we should control. We feel to respond to your mandate, we need to carefully say, as I say, what we know, what we don't know, and the like. We'll get that stated, and then in parallel with that, we will carefully structure those statements into... In parallel with that, we will carefully structure those statements into a common view of findings and recommendations relative to the problem. Uh, Dr. Mahoney, I, 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 I'm reluctant to interrupt you, but I just want to clarify in my own mind what you've been saying for the last minute or two. Do I understand you to say that this collection of outside experts that you're bringing in uh, and uh, some members of your interagency scientific committee are going to give us a cost and benefit appraisal of what the existing science tells us, the costs of controls and the benefits in terms of remediation of the problems of acid rain on forests, lakes, streams, uh, structures, and so forth. Am I correct in assuming you're going to address yourselves to costs of remediation and benefits from remediation? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the answer to your question is yes, we will, uh, indeed. I may have misled a little bit in the way I described the role of the scientist. So well, that's why I wanted to clarify it. I don't want to be misled, and I, I'm, I know you have absolutely no intention of misleading, yeah. uh, misleading us, and I respect the bona fides with which uh, you're approaching this testimony. We're very appreciative of that, and I just wanted to clarify that for the record, that we are going to hear something uh, in the next, uh, well, in the remainder of this year that we didn't find in the executive summary, namely an appraisal of costs and, a, and an appraisal of benefits so that we in the Congress and the administration can uh, bite the bullet and make some tough public policy decisions that we have to make based on your best efforts at giving us costs and benefits. Yes, Mr. Chairman, let me respond with uh, I enough. Mean, I, I take it that's your intention. Yes, it is indeed. Well, we're very much encouraged by that. I, I want to be careful, though, so I don't mislead or over-promise as to the timing of the delivery of that information. So All right, tell us something about timing. When do you expect to come up here with it? What I'm describing as a process is a, uh, we have first the step that we will prepare. We are, in fact, already started now on preparing a plan for this assessment. And as I will come to it to give a few specifics simply from the statement in a moment, the plan does include directly consideration of costs and benefits. And that plan will be published, it's our hope, within, say, three months. I don't want to give that as a promise yet because it may well be four months or more before we can get through all the complexities involved. That plan for the assessment will not by itself have dollar estimates in it, but it will indicate how we are preparing those. And, and you'll have that, yeah, yeah, you'll have that, conservatively speaking, by Labor Day, shortly after Labor I, Day. I think that's a good characterization. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, and if you don't have the figures on costs of remediation and figures on the benefits of remediation, you'll give us some idea of the process by which you're, uh, you plan to achieve those figures and uh, the system and uh, some timetable, I presume, for when they will be available. Yes, sir, we will specifically, and we have in mind the 
formal comments in the GAO report, which you referenced in your opening statement. We know the requirement of the statute and the reminder in the GAO report that this be covered. To be clear, I note that it is inappropriate to develop economic analyses when the uncertainties are so great that the problem is not well scoped. Now, we could argue about whether they should have appeared last year, but standing today, our view is, number one, we have to respond to the mandate to provide this information, and number two, I believe that we have the information to make a reasonable estimate, and that, in fact, what NAPAP should be doing, obviously, we don't do the value analysis finally, but our job is to structure information, including costs and benefits, make it available so that it can be viewed and debated and argued about, and then you all and others who have to review the process can have this at least as a starting point of the, as the best estimates we can provide you. Well, Dr. Mahoney, you had me back on my heels for a minute, or maybe I should say on the edge of my chair for a minute, uh, a few paragraphs back, but as you proceeded, uh, you, you answered all our questions, and uh, we'll be very satisfied and very encouraged if you do just what you said you were going to do in the last few sentences. I apologize for interrupting, but uh, your, your testimony has been very interesting, very uh, thoughtful, very provocative, and uh, in many ways encouraging. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll try to finish promptly so you can get on to broader There's questions. There's no rush. Too. Take your time, Dr. Mahoney. Okay, thank you. Well, I would say next, I, at the time we stop for this very useful dialogue to clarify this important matter. I was about to describe uh, in some more substance the elements of the plan for the assessment which we expect to publish for your review and for the public's review later this year. Uh, these are listed, I would note, for anyone making a reference on page 9 and 10 of the prepared statement. Our plan for assessment will include the following items. There are ten of them all together. First, the specific definitions of the effects being considered. To our best ability to say what precisely do we describe as the effects, the range of them that have to be considered. Second, the questions we need to put about this. No one in the room will dispute the matter that is acid rain bad for us? Yes, it is. Uh, the, the matter is a much more specific and formal set of questions about what we can do. Third, the means by which we characterize the severity of effects. How do we characterize a problem in lakes or other surface waters and forests and the like? We have many definitions and much dispute about this, but one of the principal things NAPAP can do is to help propose definitions we could come to some agreement about which give us a common base for examining these effects. Next, the methods and data bases available to prepare geographic and other inventories of these effects. It's one thing to know we're concerned about what goes on in an individual lake. It's another thing to say how many lakes like this might we have in North America. And we have to define exactly how we try to do that. Well, you're right on target. Uh, th that was one of the things that concerned us very much about the uh, executive summary. Uh, they talked about uh, uh, acres, but they didn't talk about number of lakes. And uh, your addressing the number of lakes would, would be a big help to us. Thank you. I would point out there were statements about percentages of lakes and the, the data on numbers there. But that point by itself might arguably be a, a, a difference in style as to presentation, but I know the sense of your overall concern. Uh, simply to finish the list then, our plan for our final products will also include the approaches we use in demonstrating cause and effect relationships. And we all, whether we are proponents or concerned observers of possible control, have to deal specifically with what do we know? Is, is our view of causation direct enough to assure that if we invest the national resources in control finally, that we'll get some real benefit from it? And again, a, NAPAP, of course, doesn't deal with what we should invest finally, but we should do our best job of telling you what the science says about our degree of knowledge and certainty in that cause and effect chain. Let Next. me just uh, state at this point that uh, we, we are very appreciative of your attitude and your stated intentions, and what you've just told us is, uh, of course, essential to uh, the work when you pass the 
the ball to us and to the administration. And let me assure you that there is nobody on this uh, subcommittee or this full committee or in this Congress that wants to do, uh, that wants to impose any silly, unproductive, unjustifiable costs uh, on business, on uh, commerce, on our economy. We are in a desperate uh, state of uh, uh, competition in trying to retain our, our uh, role as uh, world-class uh, actors in, in global commerce. Uh, nobody wants to burden industry with foolish, silly, unjustifiable costs. That's the last thing we want to do. Uh, what we're looking for uh, is uh, a level of control that is clearly sensible, that is clearly uh, justifiable, practical, doable, and that will not uh, impede uh, industry in any uh, uh, significant extent in, uh, in competing abroad. We know that industry is, is uh, in a desperate state of uh, needing to compete uh, and not with one arm um, tied behind their back. So uh, let me just reassure you and the administration that we are all as one here, and this crosses party lines in the House, it crosses um, camera lines, it goes to the House and the Senate, both parties. We want to do what's clearly sensible, uh, what's clearly justified. Uh, the point of view of the administration up to now in the last eight years is that we don't, uh, that we have to know everything to do anything. We don't believe that anymore, and most scientists don't believe it. They think there is a certain uh, minimal level of control uh, procedures and processes that we can direct take place that is clearly justifiable. We're not looking toward a 100% pollution-free environment. We're looking for work-a-day, hands-on, practical results that are viable and that are economically justifiable. So we are as one in that hope and that intention. Please, please proceed. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Indeed, well, uh, completing my list of those elements in the plan for the assessment, we will be addressing again the matter of the emissions data for the common pollutants and their future projections. We will provide an updated view of the state of control measures, various technologies, various alternative practices, uh, which might bring us to lower emissions because the engineering and scientific job is to survey all the most efficient, least costly means of achieving what you decide we have to achieve finally. And as you asked before, and you'll find written here specifically, we will be providing economic analysis methods. And I might comment just a moment on the matter that there are two halves to the economic analysis problem. One is on the control half, and the other is on the effect or benefit half. On the control half, uh, I certainly wouldn't claim to speak for economists with whom I've been speaking frequently now. There are many disputes about how you might approach uh, control cost estimation, keep, keeping in mind all the matters of annualizing capital costs and energy penalties and disefficiencies and the like. But at least that part of the problem is rather concrete, and we can do it and debate the results, and I would argue the range of uncertainty is not too great. I say that to focus us for just a minute on the benefit side. We know for policy evaluation that we would like to have the best view possible of a dollar estimate for all of the related effects and their mitigation that we're dealing with and lakes and forests and so forth. In some areas, if we're talking about commercial productivity for commercial forests, for example, we can give those dollar estimates. When we deal with basically non-monetary matters, preservation of our environment over the long time, we can make attempts to use the various economic assessment methods available, and we will do this because it's important to make an estimate, but I simply warn while viewing this that no one should ever assume that it is as simple as saying here is uh, $50 billion of cost and here are $80 billion of benefit as defined by some method like this and we know what we should do. Uh, so I'm presenting that w as NAPAP, we will do our best job of providing information of this sort. And through the means of this hearing, though I call attention to the fact that our information must be used 
well, we'll try to do our job, but we have to be certain that it doesn't take an out of co context uh, and quote it in a way which isn't intended as we develop it. In that sense, we will be presenting our plans for full economic assessment that will accompany the final, uh, the 1990 reports and will be developed in the time between now and then. Now I'd like to close this part so uh, quickly, so I'll move on and uh, note you also asked in your invitation uh, for my views about the scientific and policy uncertainties which will remain in 1990. I'd start by noting that we have seen the evolution of substantial changes in our scientific views about acid rain over the last many years. Now I don't mean that anyone has, would now say we don't have a problem uh, as compared to a few years ago, but I would note that in the late 1970s and early 1980s, most of the focus on acid rain was rather specifically on the control of sulfur oxides. And strategies, had they been developed or imposed at that time, would have addressed that issue alone, I would argue, or would have most likely done that because that was really our focus. In more recent times, we have seen the great importance of ozone as a damage agent uh, for the forests and in other cases. When we view control strategy, clearly we have to view those things together in making the choices about how to achieve the, the most benefit for any controls finally imposed. And even more recently, we have seen a good deal of information about atmospheric chemistry processes which suggest changes in our knowledge about the scope and geographic coverage of acid deposition associated with various patterns of emission. Taking this all together to your question of what we'll know in 1990, I view that the assessment methodology and framework we are now developing and will publish for your review, we hope will represent a constructive step toward putting all of this information together while leaving the door open to the new things we'll hear, but at least giving a structure so that we'll have something much more of the nature of a common base to work from. With all that in mind, I would draw the attention of the committee to one broad area of uncertainty uh, that I feel will remain in 1990. We'll do our best before then. Uh, some of this is be outside of the scope of NAPAP is now constructed, but it is this view that the regional air pollution problem is, I think nearly all observers would now say, is very much a, viewed as a combined oxidant and acid problem. The controls for oxidants uh, are in large part different than those for the acid species. They're, they're, somewhat, they're the same in the case of nitrogen controls, but they're different otherwise. I'm certain that no matter what we do in the next two years, we will have substantial questions of the combined impacts of oxidants and the acid species to address in 1990 and beyond. And I, I note it now because clearly we should pay as much attention from this time as we can in the context of our analyses. Finally, you've asked about research needs and program structure which might go on beyond 1990. In the matter of research needs, I'm not now prepared to give a detailed list which ought to command a good deal of thought and indeed would be most appropriate after we have been through this assessment planning that we're now doing over the next few months. But I can certainly cite the general categories of the research needs that will go beyond 1990. First on the list is continued trend monitoring. It's essential that we do not back away from supporting the programs of field measurement that will give us, in the end, our best ground truth on whether we're making progress or not in the next several years. So in my view, any forward-looking view has to start with the essential need to keep that kind of base program underway. Second, we will need to keep the databases and computer models that are used for the various analyses current so that we don't invest all that we have in this program and find in one year that no one knows how to run the models or has kept the database up to, up to speed. Uh, third, there will be many special studies that will need to continue, some of which are already identified by the agencies and are in fact long-term studies. You can't do a 10-year growth profile for forests in three years no matter what we set for a program is an obvious example. And fourth as a category, 
we have much to do to continue our work on dose response functions, uh, dose response analyses. And that's right at the heart of the question. If we're going to have deposition in our waterways or forests, uh, we know that there are responses. Some are important, some are not. We have to continue our view to better understand these so that we can support the investments for control that may need to be made. Now, I'll close with a comment on future program structure. To do a good management job, we entirely intend to present the NAPAP final reports on deadline in 1990. And we're prepared to do all we can to give interim reports of real substance as we go along. And I'd be glad to work with the committee and committee staff and other committees, in fact, to uh, let you know the details of our programs and try to respond to special questions as we can, consistent with doing good quality scientific work along the way. But we will end the program and deliver our reports as required. Obviously, the needs for analysis in this area will not go away at that time. And indeed, we look at the, <coughs> when NAPAT finishes and delivers its results of the decade of work, we believe that a major benefit of it is the set of information and analysis that will be put on the table for use by the Congress and others subsequently to make some of these difficult analyses. So I have suggested in my statement, and I'd say here as a kind of a closing point, given that we know there is a need, but that there are substantial questions about the level of investment in NAPAP and the, and the utility of an interagency program, I've tried to capture it in one sentence this way. If the benefits of this kind of integrated assessment are adequately demonstrated by the plan we now develop and its working out over the next two years, and if policy relevant questions still <coughs> remain two years from now, then I believe we should carefully examine, or you all and the executive branch should carefully examine those means which would capture the good aspects of this program for continued, uh, for continued use. May well not be all aspects because we know there are things that could be done better, but I think we should leave it on the table for considering what would be, in my view or jargon, a post-NAPAP program, perhaps. Not an extension of NAPAP, but the issue of let's take what we've seen and learned and where we have re remaining issues, let's consider the model and improve it and put the appropriate elements of some follow-on program into place. Mr. Chairman, thank you for entertaining a long statement. I hope this has been useful in giving you a view of the uh, plans we're developing. Well, thank you, Dr. Mahoney. Your statement has been useful and in, in many ways gives us ground for uh, hope that things are going to improve and that we're going to get a degree of integration that we haven't seen up to now, which is very important. And uh, <clears throat> in general, that you're going to be responsive to uh, this uh, drumbeat of criticism you heard, not only from the Hill, but from scientific circles, you know, at all, po at all points in the spectrum. I'd now like to yield to my colleague from North Carolina, Tim Valentine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to say uh, at the beginning that I, I think that I uh, recognize a uh, parochial political uh, interest as well as any member of this body. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, while some members of the Congress are um, uh, guided primarily by those considerations on, on this uh, the question of acid rain, that, that most members, uh, this, this problem would not come with, within their uh, uh, catalog of uh, interests that were nearest and dearest to their hearts. Uh, but I, I have experienced a, a certain amount of frustration when uh, an attempt to make a determination as to what the Congress should do when confronted by uh, people who would really, uh, an interest who would really prefer that we do nothing, are able to say to us, well, nobody really knows, Congressman, what we should do. That this body of scientific opinion says that the destruction which occurs to the uh, great national forests in the southeastern part of the United States and, and, um, and other uh, woods lands uh, that it's not because of, of the problem that some other people say that it is, that we don't know what to do. So um, you shouldn't support this legislation because it might be harmful indeed. 
Do you think that that uh, what you are about, that uh, the National Acid uh, Precipitation Assessment Program will really produce uh, some uh, answers or some suggested solutions, or will it, uh, in, in your opinion, come forward with a, an opinion and several dissenting opinions? Yeah. Well, Mr. Valentine, we have discussed the, uh, the view of entertaining reports of dissenting opinions directly in the various reports that NAPAP would issue over these next two years in the sense of providing a full range of viewpoints where that is appropriate. However, the mission of NAPAP is to integrate and structure our overall information to do the best job we can of identifying a series of priorities so that you and your colleagues in the Congress, as well as the, we might say the nation generally, can view those and either agree or change them in your own mind, but ultimately decide which of the many effects that we're investigating are those that deserve controls to what level. And so we do see the concept as that of integration and structuring. And to do that job, we have to create the lists of those effects we believe are important and carefully document them. That was what I was trying to indicate in the statement. Uh, and understand that that material, we hope, would be used in the sense of good inquiry intended. Not, not as a whipping boy, uh, anyone can dispute the list, but someone has to take responsibility to say what are the most important ones and how severe are they and what should we really control. And our view is that that is what the Congress has char charged NAPAP to do in this program. The science has gone on a long time. It's continuing very intensely right now. But in this reporting phase, we've got to pull that information together and give you the best fruits of our scientific view in a way that allows you to help make the differentiations you spoke of. Is there an organization uh, similar to this uh, in existence and operating in Canada? Uh, uh, similar, similar, but not, uh, uh, similar, but not, I would not argue it is exactly the same. But yes, sir, uh, there's similar, similar skills and focus are available. The chairman of our committee, of course, has been a, a leader in the uh, effort, effort to, to uh, do something about this problem since I have uh, known him. And uh, you can just uh, feel the frustration uh, when he um, talks about the, the situation confronting our Canadian neighbors. And we talk about, and I understand that, uh, uh, and we talk about the, what is it, the 1 to 10 ratio that uh, the population in, in this colossus uh, to the south of Canada ten times of what they have, but when you put the, when you, when you put into focus the, um, the, the fact that, as I understand it, uh, a substantial, maybe uh, as much as 75 percent of Canadian industrial development, it would be within 100 miles of the Canadian-U.S. Uh, border, and uh, the potential for uh, a, a, um, a problem from industrial uh, pollutants there. Uh, what I want to know is, are you able to say to us, uh, Doctor, tell us what has Canada done uh, since uh, a lot of uh, talk has uh, we had here about our obligation? And I have had people to come to me, you know, through the back door and say, "Well, Congressman, you know, you guys ought to do something," but they haven't really done a lot in Canada except to ask us for action. What do you say to that? Well, Mr. Valentine, I, let me answer uh, to the best of my knowledge. I'm not prepared to give a, a broad expert view about the Canadian actions. Uh, specifically, I've had so much on my plate in the last two months since assuming this job, I have not stepped aside to examine the Canadian side directly. Even so, the Canadians use proportionately less electric power generated from fossil fuel combustion than, the, than we do here on our side of the border because of the large amount of hydropower available given the small population base. Second, as to reducing sulfur dioxide, a major fraction of all of the sulfur dioxide emission in eastern Canada has arisen from a few large smelter operations, including in particular the one at Sudbury, as is well known. The Canadians have taken substantial steps to reduce the emissions from those individual facilities. Canadians are also now embarked on a program to control motor vehicle emissions 
to bring them down to the range we have already controlled here in the United States. So the Canadians are doing things and it makes it easy to uh, cite rhetorical statements on either side. I would argue in some cases though the Canadian emissions per capita or, and per industry type and per vehicle are coming down more nearly toward the U.S. emissions. The problem is, as you first say, stated, the United States population base is so much larger that we, have, we are the net exporter. And no one disputes that the net flow across the border of the pollutants is from the United States toward, the, toward Canada. And that arises in the end because of the very large population on our side of the border and the related industry and, and so forth. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Congressman Bob Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is. Uh, I too, uh, uh, Dr. Mahoney, want to thank you for your for your candor and realize that you stepped into a very difficult position. Uh, I don't want to dwell on the past, but I, in in reviewing the difference between the interim uh, report and the executive summary, uh, I think it's a fair question to ask. Uh, that you could you give to the Congress uh, uh, some explanation? I mean, we have an oversight responsibility here in this 10-year uh, study, if you will. And can you give us some explanation as to why uh, the striking difference between the executive summary of Dr. Culp and the uh, interim assessment? Uh, why? Uh, what is what is the motive? For, for the difference? Was it Culp himself? Uh, was it uh, uh, just what is the reason for such a, uh, a stark difference between the two items? Well, Mr. Smith, I'd want to be very careful about trying to speak about uh, motive because that's so inferential and I don't know directly. It's a short and honest answer to that. But I'd like to, if I could, go back to the first part of your question and cite that I believe I've, looked, I've tried to look very carefully, of course, at the interim assessment and the related documents. Uh, all that you asked me is, of course, a series of obvious questions for me coming into my position. Uh, I honestly believe that the interim assessment uh, in the executive summary is not as distant from the underlying science as it is often characterized as. What I think I see is, uh, I try to use the words in my statement, there is a difference in emphasis. Uh, there's a difference in issues covered. Uh, it is hard to find something in the assessment, in the executive summary, that I you could call inaccurate, uh, based on what is in the document. What hmm. I see is that uh, that executive summary was released uh, in a. This is all a highly contentious matter. It was disputed quickly on every side uh, and as a simple tactical matter or matter of procedure the fact that it had not been seen or viewed in, in draft in a formal sense meant that it was a target for characterization as being a widely different from the underlying reports and I don't well, think it's that widely different is my my underlying my, my comment. Well I um, we don't have time to go into the whole uh, document. Obviously, I don't have time in my line of questions. I've got so many questions, I don't know where to begin, really. But uh, I, I disagree with your assessment there. I think that uh, just to use one, uh, a couple of simple examples, uh, uh, the, the emphasis on uh, not including smaller lakes, uh, for example, uh, in, the, uh, in, the sum in the summary, uh, uh, I forget the acreage size, uh, eight or nine acres or whatever it was, uh, 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 number one. Number two, using a different uh, acidity uh, pH uh, for for the the yardstick. I, I think that uh, I don't know. I'm sure you're aware that uh, I, I think that this NAPAP summation uh, really uh, cut right into the credibility uh, of of the whole 10 year study. It certainly did with me. It's got the Canadians furious. Uh, I'm sure that's on the table today with uh, Prime Minister Mulroney and President Reagan. Uh, and I. Uh, I think it. I think it's hurt badly. Uh, the, this this report. I mean, we uh, the whole study, the whole the whole credibility of the 10-year study. We've got 
By the time this thing is completed, you're looking at approximately $500 million in expenses. I mean, uh, I don't, we could have put a hell of a lot of acid rain controls on, uh, uh, on, uh, on some uh, uh, just converting to low sulfur coal. Let's, let's forget the controls. Let's just convert to low sulfur coal. We could have done a lot of conversions for 500 million bucks and had something to look at at the end of 10 years that we could, that we could put our teeth into. Uh, so I guess what I'm asking you is, is I mean, you can, this, this thing has been overstudied and, and uh, uh, under-resolved, let's face it, uh, the whole issue. I mean, I mean, you can find scientists on both sides. You know that and I know that. And I, I guess what I'm asking you is at the end of the 10 years or in 1990 when you come in with your final report, which I hope will be on time, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, uh, are we going to see just another ambivalent uh, study that does not get definitive, that does not come to the point and say yes or no, we need implementation legislation, uh, we need controls, or we don't, or are we just going to have another one of these ambiguous uh, reports that doesn't say anything that costs us a half a million dollars? I mean, I, I'm tired of it. I, I'm not a scientist. I can't sit here like you gentlemen and say whether or not uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, all of the acidity in the lakes uh, or, uh, or all of the problems that we have related to acid rain are caused necessarily by uh, uh, coal burning uh, power plants. So of course that's not the case. But the point is if we had some controls and we phased them in and some of us in Congress have been trying to do that with legislation, not dramatic legislation, just a start. Like the Canadians have done. I think the Canadians have shown that there has been an effect on, the leg on, on what they have done. I think they've proven that. I don't think there's any question about that, even by the doubters. So I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm asking you a big question here, but what are, we gonna what are you going to conclude in the end? Are we going to have a definitive statement about acid rain at the end of this 10-year report? Study, 10-year study, excuse me. I believe we will have as definitive a statement. I, I hate to have to use any extra words. I'd like to say simply, yes, sir. In fact, Mr. Smith, we have to understand the complexity and the uncertainty of the whole problem, so there is no way that the scientific or engineering community can simply say yes and no about choices that the Congress will have to make. But I don't mean that to be an apology or a, a, a leaving the door open. I'd, I'd like to represent that the what I've tried to outline in my written statement and to summarize here in my comments represents our very best thought, and as an individual, my very best thought to the matter of structuring all of our information so we can do all we can on exactly that. And we intend, to, as I say, to publish this plan in the next few months as soon as we can get it viewed and reviewed properly. We're trying to say that we understand there are a whole range of, of effects of acid rain. Well, what, what we want to do is to try to once and for all give our best view of how severe and important these various effects are, how widespread they are, and how much we know about what specifically, what the sources are, what specifically causes one set versus another set, and give that information to the Congress and the nation in a form that can greatly advance the ability to take from that and make some decisions. But I think, uh, I think the figure is $389 million in, in in research uh, thus far to, at the federal level that we've spent, um, you know, it just seems to me we, we have uh, enough research to be able to conclude that at least there is some cause-effect situation here. But there are so many inconsistencies. I didn't say, uh, you, you did uh, state that, uh, that uh, Dr. Culp's uh, uh, report, uh, summation was not inaccurate. I didn't say it was inaccurate, but I think it was misleading. Uh, I think you can play uh, the games with statistics if you use a pH of 5 instead of a pH of 6, if you use small lakes instead of large, uh, don't use small lakes, you use large lakes. Uh, but there are a lot of inconsistencies in terms of both congressional and administrative policy. Uh, for example, clean, the Clean Air Act. I mean, you mentioned the ozone, uh, the, the fact that ozone and, and acidity are both factors. They are. Well, then we ought to pass the Clean Air Act. We haven't done that. We haven't reauthorized it, uh, and uh, I think that uh, a combination of implementation legislation and the Clean Air Act might give us some yardstick to measure this thing by, and yet we don't do either. And, and if we're, if, if again, I don't mean to repeat myself, Mr. Chairman, but if we go back uh, at the end of 1990 and we got another 10-year study, 
uh, millions of dollars more spent on research. Probably uh, somebody will want to reauthorize the, the thing for another 10 years, NAPAP for another 10 years, will spend another billion dollars, study it some more. And I just think we ought to, once and for all, just, just get down. You ought to have the guts to come forth and say, look, it's not a problem. Uh, it'll go away. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, go, uh, uh, we'll go to solar power 10 years from now and the hell with it. We'll, it'll, it'll go away. Don't worry about it. Or it is a problem. And we ought to do something about it. I think it's time we do that. That some of the statistics, I don't I mean it's not your fault. You're the new guy, and I know, you, uh, and I'm not. I don't mean to direct it at you. But some of the the, the statistics in there, uh, and 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 the facts in that in that summation are ludicrous. For example, the uh, as Mr. as the chairman knows, and this committee knows, we just changed the policy regarding the second nuclear waste repository. Uh, we totally eliminated it. To, went, to go to one repository because of a 40 to 50 percent uh, uh, expected reduction in nuclear waste because we're not building nuclear power plants anymore. And for them to conclude in there that we're going to have uh, three times as many nuclear power plants and therefore that is going in the next 20 years, by either 2030 rather, next 50 years, that's going to be a factor in causing us to have less of a problem with this is absolutely ridiculous. And that's, and that's coming from the same government, the same Department of Energy with two conflicting uh, uh, analyses. I, just, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I'd like somebody to answer that question. How can you say that in, by the year 2030 we're going to have three times as many nuclear power plants and at the same time come out and say that the DOE, by the DOE, would come forth and say, well, uh, we, we don't need a second repository because we have 50 percent reduction in nuclear waste. If you've got a power plant, you've got waste unless somebody's come up with a way to take care of that. I'd like somebody from DOE to answer that. And that's my final question, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> this is one of the questions that was raised in the Canadian critique. If the gentleman could make this a brief answer, we're going to have to, uh, well, the second bells are coming in a minute or two and we have about two minutes after that and yes. then we're going to have to break. The projections that were used in the modeling were based on the, the fifth national energy plan and that plan did foresee a reemergence of nuclear option after the turn of the century. Now we're working on the sixth, and that's not available at this time. But uh, if it's assumed that nuclear generation does not increase above the projected level for 2000, in other words, you have a cap in 2000, SO2 emissions would be about 1.5 million metric tons higher in the year 2030 than projected in the base case. So if you add 1.5 million metric tons to what you saw in the base case for the year 2030, um, that would correct for the um, forecasted continuing growth in nuclear mm -hmm. power. In other words, <clears throat> that would be an increase of about 8% over the 2030 forecast of the total SO2 emissions, but would still represent a decrease of 14% from the 1980 levels. So you're suggesting we wait till 2045 before we have any implementation legislation? No, I, I, I'm not suggesting that at all. Well, you're projecting out there, uh, so I just... I'm telling you what would happen if you corrected the NEPP-5 for nuclear growth put a cap on it in 2000, would increase SO2 emissions in 2030 by 1.5 million tons. And that's 8 percent higher than what you saw in the report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, we'll, we'll suspend for 15 minutes for this roll call vote. We'll be back in just a few moments with the conclusion of this hearing on acid rain. Joel. The crisis in Ireland will be the topic of a speech by the Prime Minister of Ireland, Charles Haughey, at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. The Prime Minister will discuss recent violence in Northern Ireland and the fight against terrorism. Following his remarks, Mr. Haughey will answer questions from students. Join C-SPAN Saturday, April 30th, beginning at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. Pacific Time.
next, the conclusion of Wednesday's hearing before the House Science, Space and Technology Subcommittee on Natural Resources, Agricultural Research and the Environment. That panel heard testimony on the National Acid Rain Research Program. We'll, uh, we'll start in again, and uh, when, as and if Congressman Heffley uh, returns, I'll, I'll yield to him, as I indicated I would. Uh, uh, Dr. Mahoney, we, we found your testimony very interesting, and, and we found you to be a thoughtful and, and forthright uh, witness, and we appreciate that. That, we hope, is a harbinger of change. Uh, let me ask you just a few questions, not to take up too much time. Uh, as uh, several of us have indicated, the, uh, the uh, National Lake Water Survey was a large survey that at best could provide an accurate snapshot of the condition of a large number of lakes at one point in time. The survey did not involve long-term studies to determine changes in pH over the seasons. And as you know, the, the pH factor is generally uh, lower, they're generally higher in the fall than it is in the spring. And it didn't uh, go over a number of years uh, to uh, determine observed acid rain deposition levels. Yet, the executive summary states, and I quote, most lakes in the Northeast are unlikely to become more acid in the near future. Now, do you find factual verification for that in the several hundred pages of documentation that undergirded the executive summary? In other words, is this a statement of fact or is this a, a, a possibly interesting hypothesis? Well, Mr. Chairman, let me... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I believe that that is a statement of inference from the underlying information. I don't think any statement can be called simply that of fact. Uh, Is it a logical inference that you would deduce from looking at all of the uh, evidence on an integrated basis? Would that be a logical inference? I believe it can be, but I, no, the no, reason no, no. I'm, I don't want to know I'm if it can be. I want to know if you consider that to be a logical inference. Mr. They, they made a finding that to many of us is right. in absolute stark uh, conflict with the clearly uh, understood credible evidence of these hundreds of pages of scientific documentation. They say most lakes in the Northeast are unlikely to become more acid in the near future. Now as best as I understand the Queen's English, that is a simple declarative sentence. Do you agree with it? I believe the statement deserves further investigation. Uh, Mr. Dr. Mahoney, this 35-page executive summary was supposed to be an integrated analysis of two or three hundred pages of scientific documentation. Now, if we have to take a simple declarative statement of fact out of that 35-page statement and say it deserves further scientific investigation, uh, doesn't that uh, give you pause as to whether this 35-page executive summary really is an executive summary? Sir, yes. Can I consult with my colleagues? No, no, me? no. You don't need to consult with your colleagues. Mr. Chairman, the reason that I'm, uh, I answer with some hesitation, as you, as with you know... With great hesitation. Well, for, for good reason, in my of course view. you have good reason. I wouldn't want to be sitting in your, in your seat right now. That's a very embarrassing question, and you're, you're in the catbird seat, and you have to answer it. Would you like me to move to the next question? No, sir. I, I'd like to, I'd like, if All I right, could. Do you subscribe to that one sentence? That's a simple declarative sentence, as I understand the Queen's English. And after all, the Queen's English is the one thing that separates us from the beasts of the jungle. The ability con to convey thought clearly. And yes. concisely, do you subscribe to that statement? 
I will suspend and not subscribe to that statement at this time. Thank you very much. Now let's go on to the next okay. question. You, you are a very honorable man. <coughs> uh, can I ask you, uh, isn't it true that a panel of scientists reviewing uh, EPA work stated that it's presently impossible to state how many more lakes are likely to become acid in the near future? Yes, sir. They've said that. Okay. Isn't it true that even if the lakes have reached, as a hypothesis, a, a state of uh, a steady state, a chemical steady state, that at the same time further biological damage could be occurring? Yes, sir. I think that's true, and okay. I don't think the statement would argue against that. The summary. All right. Now, in the interim assessment. Now, the interim assessment used Canadian data. 150,000 lakes up there have been damaged. Why wasn't the Canadian data on aquatic, on aquatic damage included in the assessment? Wouldn't it be relevant for U.S. policymakers like uh, me and my colleagues and the, and the executive branch to know of the damage that we're inflicting on our good neighbor to the north, our number one trading partner, and a country with whom we've had uh, 3,000 miles of uh, unguarded, uh, uh, unarmed uh, borders for the entire history of this republic? Could the data have been omitted because the resources at risk in Canada, their forests, their grazing lands, their croplands, their rivers, their streams, uh, there, there, could it have been that those resources in Canada that were at risk absolutely dwarf those that are at risk in the United States. Could that be a reason why it was omitted? Mr. Chairman, the data, was, the data were omitted because of serious questions about the scientific comparability of the Canadian data set compared to that available on the United States side. We have a plan to go back to our colleagues in Canada and address the issues of data comparability so that we can include full <coughs> consideration of that data, taking account of real scientific questions about interpretation in the work we're doing at this time. Uh, can you just tell me briefly, because time is running short, what was the problem in comparability? Comparability, uh, as I understand it, and I, I want to explain because it reflects on me, not on the report otherwise. Now, wait a minute. Uh, Dr. Mahoney, let me make it very clear. None of this reflects on you. You're the new boy on the block. You came on deck uh, after this report had been issued. Nobody holds you responsible for it. Uh, this was a personal uh, achievement of Dr. Culp's. He must have gone into the attic and written this 35 uh, page report on his own because there was no peer review. There was no involvement of his scientific, uh, the interagency scientific committee uh, as Congress certainly expected would happen. Uh, this was a, an individual creation of Dr. Culp, and he quit within days after uh, it was released. So uh, nobody is holding you responsible. Uh, what we would like to hold you responsible for is taking uh, proper, uh, thoughtful, prudent, and scientifically uh, justified efforts at remediating some of the damage. And I'm not talking about damage that's done by acid rain. I'm talking about damage that's done by this very confusing, very mischievous, very destructive 35-page summary. So please, I want to make the record very clear, nobody's holding you responsible for anything. And we think you have the potential and the possibility of doing an exemplary job Thank based you, on Mr. many of the things that you've said this morning. Uh, let me ask you another question. The executive summary contains a projection of future sulfur, sulfide dioxide emissions that contains a number of interesting assumptions, some of which have been pointed out by my colleague from New Hampshire, uh, Congressman Bob Smith. Uh, the assumption that current generating plants will be retired after 50 years lies in the face of all hands-on practical experience. That nuclear generation will treble by the year 2030 when we're virtually out of the business of producing new nuclear facilities. That new co uh, clean coal technology will be rapidly adopted. I don't know where the evidence for that is. You can find it in Canada. There isn't a single energy producer in Canada that doesn't, excuse me, uh, in Japan 
There isn't a single energy producer in Japan that doesn't have scrubbers. The, uh, what's the name of that big, uh, the, Sud the Sudsbury plant in Canada, not many miles north of the border, formerly one of the biggest uh, polluters in the world. They're spending millions and millions of dollars correcting that, putting on the state-of-the-art technology across the length and breadth of industrial Europe, leaving aside Great Britain, who is uh, stalling uh, and, and hulking down just as we are, but European uh, countries are rapidly installing state-of-the-art uh, anti-pollution devices. We aren't, and uh, it seems to me that to make these three assumptions uh, that the Congressional Research Service called over-optimistic and improbable really is disingenuous. You might call it the 1988 new definition of chutzpah. Really, to present that uh, kind of uh, conclusionary uh, thinking to the Congress and to the executive branch. It boggles the mind. Mr. Chairman, with respect, could I respond on, of on, on one matter on this? Yes, indeed. Because I, I'm not in a position to respond as fully as I would like, simply yes. speaking as an individual. And this was the well, sense well, of wait my... Wait a minute. Why, why are you not in a position to respond as fully as you'd like? Uh, I, I'll explain directly. It has nothing to do with someone telling me not to respond. It has to do with what I have been doing since I came to my job two months ago. Well, and it also has to do with what you've been doing since 1982 as a diligent and participating member of this whole process. A very I, sophisticated I, I don't dispute that at all, yes. but I did want to point out that as all of my colleagues here at the table and many others will know, when I came to the position, I viewed that we had an absolutely critical need to pay attention to the process of the assessment planning. And as a result, we have identified every one of the matters you have just spoken about as specific technical issues in dispute as needing careful review by me and by my principal technical colleagues. I have not yet conducted those reviews because I've spent the last two months, 12-hour days, trying to get the process on track. And I simply wanted to make clear for the record that I don't mean a hesitation or less than full response on some matters that you raise to mean that I have a judgment one way or the other. I, I'm not trying to dispute some of the characterizations you make, but I did want to point out as a matter of process that in our program, coming in as the new director, I've given such full attention to getting the assessment plan structure started that I've had to take a reservation on going back to careful review of exactly the kinds of issues you've been citing. Mr. Uh, Dr. Mahoney, I respect that, and I respect the effort you put in on the subject of process that, as you know, is of deep concern to us, and I, I respect your very thoughtful and um, and hopefully promising new initiatives to uh, get this whole uh, process question under control as the Congress intended it to be. I, I respect that and we're encouraged by it. Let me just take off oh, a baker's dozen of areas uh, in which we have profound uh, reservations about not the great body of work but by this uh, artfully crafted executive summary that we think does such a disservice to the national understanding of the uh, acid rain uh, threat that we're faced with. Uh, the executive summary uh, defined acid rain as, as lakes with those of pH, pHs of five or less. When going to six or less, which defines many of those lakes, would have given us ten times the number of lakes at risk. Ten times, excluding data on damage to Canadian lakes. Now, you may tell us there's a comparability problem. I just find it difficult to believe that if there had been a, a sincere, genuine effort to include the extraordinary damage that we've done to Canada uh, <coughs> by the flow of our pollutions from the Ohio River Basin up to Canada, clearly identifiable, predictable, quantifiable. We could have found a way to do it. The Canadians uh, are uh, deeply concerned about this. They've devoted their top scientific personnel to this. We find it a little hard to swallow that we couldn't have included the Canadian data uh, into this uh, uh, 
summary because of uh, com comparability questions. Reporting lake damages in terms of percentages of lake area rather than in numbers of lakes, which would have doubled or trebled the number of lakes involved, excluding small lakes under eight acres, which are even more vulnerable to acid rain damage, failing to quantify economic costs of acid rain damage. I mean, that goes to your central mission, integrating costs with benefits. The question of costs was totally left out, excluding information on episodic shocks, which may cause significant uh, acid rain damage, like heavy snowfalls. Measuring lakes for pH in the fall, when pHs are higher rather than the spring, when they're lower. Excluding data linking emissions from Midwest power plants to acid rain in, North e in the northeast of the United States, all up and down the Atlantic coast and Canada. Excluding available data on acidified streams. Concluding that few, if any, additional lakes will, be, will become acidic in the northeast when the best available information says, we don't know using unjustifiably optimistic assumptions about penetration of new technology or early, or, uh, early retirement of power plants, uh, growth in nuclear power uh, to project the decline in sulfur dioxide emissions, when all of these things fly flagrantly, transparently, uh, <laughs> against what our eyes and ears and minds and intelligences tell us are the facts that we have to work with. I mean, the 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 disingenuous intellectual dishonesty of those pretensions really boggle the mind. They're not worthy of our government. They're not certainly worthy, they certainly aren't worthy of you and the honesty and the forthcoming fashion which you have testified this morning. Uh, the, and finally the conclusion that no abrupt changes in forest are likely when the best available information here too is that we simply don't know. Now, and taking all of these uh, matters, and just asking you as a matter of judgment, uh, coming from a, 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 a very professional, highly uh, motivated uh, individual, would you say that that executive summary that contains the features that I just mentioned uh, is a fair and accurate summary of the uh, two or three hundred pages of technical data which undergirded that executive summary? Is that a fair and accurate summary? I, I believe that summary can and should be expanded and be made more representative of the full body of the information we have available. Well, Dr. Mahoney, I welcome that answer. And I would like you to tell us whether you would be willing to take the leadership with your uh, interagency scientific committee involvement in expanding it and perhaps going through an agonizing reappraisal and uh, perhaps a, a redraft or a, 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 a son of executive summary and give us another executive summary in 30 or 60 or 90 days that would more or less set the record straight with the American public, with our Canadian friends, with our European friends and uh, perhaps help us focus a little better on what we should be doing and what is doable, uh, what is cost effective, what the challenge is, what we ought to be addressing ourselves to. Do you think in the next month or two you might subject that executive summary to uh, some thought and perhaps some recasting and redrafting? Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to do that. Can I make a, 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 a constructive, I hope, and thoughtful answer that, that suggests a little broader context, though? Mr. Uh, Dr. Mahoney, you've been giving us constructive and thoughtful answers all morning. Uh, there's no reason why you should stop now. Okay. You've well, really point been is, a very I, encouraging. I want to answer, and I do, I... do I take that as a declarative yes, that within 30 or 60 or 90 days, We'll have a recasting of that executive summary. Sir, I would like to suggest a different context, not a declarative yes to doing that, because I'd like to point out a problem about our resource limitations. But, uh, if, uh, Dr. Mahoney, I'm talking about uh, a 35-page document that you could take home over a weekend. You could leave Friday night with that document uh, in your hip pocket and come back Monday morning. Uh, with a redrafting of that document, or let us say another executive summary. 
That, that, that's not something that you couldn't do uh, over the course of a weekend and still uh, have the opportunity of looking at all those great uh, Sunday morning uh, political talk shows. Mr. Chairman, the problem is not the time that is required to redraft the time. It is the question of the time required to consider all the basis information again. How long would it take you to do that? I believe that kind of job could be done in three months. Accepted. Contract. But contract. Can, can I, before signing my heft of that, of that contract, point out... You made an offer and I accepted. That's a contract. No. Let no, me throw a peppercorn at you. That really makes it a contract. No, sir. Uh, I, I answered a question about how long it would take. All right. I, I do... I want to put up the matter of the, the question of process that we're dealing with because I think I have a suggestion that might be helpful. Yes, And then please. I'd like the sense of, of course, your direction. Point is, as I described in my testimony, we have just embarked on an intensive job of trying to rationalize and write down the approach to planning this final assessment, including all of these matters of posing the questions to be answered very carefully and so forth, as I was describing and is laid out further in my statement. Now, that already has us, you would find in the shop and among the agencies, you'd find people in, I like to hope, uh, let me say, happy turmoil these days. I don't, it's not onerous in particular, but they're going to be very busy with that. If we take the people necessary off of that job to reconsider and redraft a suitable summary, that is to answer the, the sense of the questions that you've put as a primary mission, we will slow down substantially the matter of getting this assessment plan process done. Uh, in my best view, they're the same people. I can't give thoughtful attention to both. But uh, I'm not trying to suggest either or. I wanted to ask if you would be open to a different kind of suggestion. I wanted to put this matter of a problem. Let, let's hear your suggestion. And my suggestion then is that I believe that we could proceed with casting the plan I've been describing and as appropriate show where the existing information feeds into that plan and make that part of a resummary. Uh, the point is, the summary, uh, the 1987 interim assessment covered information available through early 1987. I can tell you if we reconsider now, do we ask the scientists to say, let's go back and look at only what we knew through January 87 or should we take account of what we know for 15 more months? And I can tell you, you can't expect a responsible scientist to take that question lightly. Nor would I want him to. I would want him to include uh, uh, what we've learned in the last 15 months or so since exactly. uh, that executive summary was published. So maybe this is a sort of a, uh, an easy way to, to back off a little bit, to say that you're reappraising that whole uh, executive summary because we have new knowledge now. Yeah. That's a, a sort of a face-saving device for everybody concerned. But I would hope, and I would like to get an expression from you that by Labor Day, which is four months from now, uh, that you could uh, recast this 35-page uh, uh, document and, 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 and make it a, as I say, executive, son of executive summary that would include in it what we've learned in the last 15 months. That's less than 10 pages a month. If we, you have four months to do a 35-page executive summary, that's, uh, it's less than eight pages a month. That's about two pages a week. Uh, I think you can do that. I have full confidence that you can do that without interrupting the other very important ongoing work that you have. Do you agree with me that you could crank out two pages a week uh, for the next four months? I remember very well, Mr. Chairman, a statement made one time to me that a letter writer wrote I apologize for sending you a long letter. I didn't have time to write you a short letter. That's absolutely and I think correct. We have Oliver to, Wendell Holmes said that. Yes, and I think we have to look at that in the matter of the two pages per week or month. I, ha I have no problem, no dispute about that, and the sense of the critiques and the sense of your questions are so broad that I, I agree we need to provide updated information. We need to provide an appropriate new summary. What I want to be very careful about is I don't want to see us commit the resources to trying to rethink everything in midstream to the point that we take our eye off the ball of getting a good plan prepared and out for public review on the final, pr on the, on the final products. Uh, Dr. Mahoney, normally I, I would pass over uh, a matter of another recast of a 35-page executive summary, except that in this case, it has had such a mischievous 
destabilizing, disorienting, unfocusing, destructive result uh, that has really shocked the scientific community into a sense of outrage. I mean, you rarely see the GAO and the Congressional Research Service uh, responding in the kind of lurid prose that they have responded to this executive summary. It was a very unusual piece of uh, disingenuous persiflage, let me say. Uh, and uh, I think it really deserves a, a, a revision. Uh, I think the public and the scientific community, and our friends in Canada, and our friends abroad, were, were shocked and horrified by it. It was so intellectually dishonest. And I think it cries for uh, clarification, let us say. It, it's most charitable. Let me give my shortest answer of the morning. Yes, sir. Great. I would be uh, pleased to date. do that. Labor uh, Day? I, th I think that would be a suitable time. Beautiful. What else do I have? Uh, look, uh, Dr. Mahoney, we've kept you far longer than we had expected or you had expected. Uh, we've covered a lot of grounds. I think it's been a very constructive change. Uh, we like, and I mean, I talk to my Republican colleagues and my Democratic colleagues as we answered these couple of roll call votes. We've all been impressed by your demeanor, by your testimony, by your forthcoming uh, attitude. And we're very much encouraged. And we will uh, wait eagerly uh, for the appearance of a, a recasting and a reclarification of that executive summary by, uh, by um, uh, Labor Day. Right. And uh, I just congratulate you. I'm very much encouraged at what I've seen and heard this morning. We very much appreciate your testimony, your patience, and uh, your good humored uh, spirit of cooperation. Thank you very, very much for coming up here. We look forward to working with you. Thank you indeed, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. We'll go to the panel number two uh, with apologies that we've uh, fallen so far behind schedule. Dr. Gene Likens, Director of the Institute of Ecosystem Studies at the New York Botanical Gardens. Uh, Dr. James Galloway, Department of Environmental Studies, uh, Sciences at the University of Virginia, and Dr. Joseph Goffman uh, of the Environmental Defense Fund. Well, I... I I, I want to welcome you all. We're very happy to have you here. I take it you've been listening uh, with interest to the proceedings of the last uh, uh, two and a half hours. Why don't uh, each of you take about eight or ten minutes? We, we, we do have to be out of this room by one o'clock. But why don't each of you take uh, eight or nine or ten minutes and uh, that'll take us to about twenty-five of, ten, of uh, one and then we'll, we'll have time for some questions. So let me let me, let, let me recognize you in the order in which uh, I introduce you, uh, Dr. Jean uh, Likens. And let me say for all of you that your, uh, print, your, your prepared testimony will be printed in full at this point in the record. So give us a summary of your uh, views, your testimony, and don't hesitate to refer to anything that you've heard this morning, either from the witness table or from uh, me and my colleagues. Thank you, Congressman Scheuer. Now, would you pull that mic close, Dr. Oh, Wilkins? Sir? Thank you, Congressman Scheuer. I've come today to talk about the uh, interim assessment from NAPAP and to talk particularly about the executive summary, which you have referred to several times this morning. I've studied the four volumes of this report extensively and enough to know that there are numerous errors and omissions and misstatements in it, as you have referred to. And in places, uh, the report has been prepared quite carelessly. And as a scientist, that bothers me. Now, you're talking about the executive summary. That's right. Thank you. Uh, I am particularly critical of the executive summary, which, in my opinion, badly misreps rep <laughs> misrepresents the general scientific understanding that we have about the problems of air pollution and particularly acid deposition. 
And I'm particularly concerned that um, the executive summary and to a lesser extent the entire uh, report ignores or discounts out of hand uh, the literally thousands of scientific papers that have been published on the topic. Now, it is true that many of these papers are listed in the uh, NAPAP report, but they are neither discussed, evaluated, or interpreted. So we call that in science padding the reference list. And even though um, it has been pointed out that uh, many of these papers are referred to in the NAPAP report, they have not been utilized. And this point came forward uh, just a little while ago when you were talking about what we already know. It's not as though we began to uh, know and to learn everything about acid rain in 1980 when the NAPAP uh, program started. There were thousands of papers published in scientific journals prior to that time. And I would suggest that these need to be uh, interpreted, included, evaluated, discarded if they're no good, used if they are. I'd like to focus my criticism on the executive summary because of three important reasons, which I'm sure are clear to you. One, 5,000 copies of the executive summary were printed, whereas only 1,500 copies of the three other more scientific volumes were published. Secondly, and particularly the news media, and I would suggest also the congressional staff, will or have read only the executive summary, and it's this impression that is given by it and its misrepresentation that I am concerned about. Uh, thirdly, the executive summary is particularly deficient and misleading, and by selective reporting of what was in the rest of the volumes has served to minimize the ecological damage caused by air pollution and acid deposition. And as a scientist, that's what concerns me most. I want to, given the limited amount of time that I have, and you have a copy of my formal testimony, I will not read uh, it. It will be printed in full in the record. Thank you. I will not read it. I, I merely want to highlight uh, just a couple of items, three to be precise, uh, that um, typify some of my concerns or characterize some of my concerns. First of all, uh, let me point out that on page uh, eight of the executive summary, it was stated, and I quote, some lakes, and I emphasize some, some lakes and streams in sensitive regions, regions appear to have been acidified by atmospheric deposition at some point in the last 50 years, unquote. Well, this statement badly minimizes the effect of acid deposition, as numerous studies have shown recent acidification occurring in large numbers of lakes in the eastern United States. In fact, my own research has shown uh, that about 80% of the lakes in the Adirondack Mountain region of New York State, for which there are comparable historic data, have been acidified since the 1930s. And recent data from lake sediments in this same region by Don Whitehead and Don Charles show that these lakes began to acidify around the 1950 time and have been acidifying to the present with no diminishment in rate. So that when you ask a question about is the acidification likely to continue, uh, there are data that would suggest <coughs> that it is likely to continue in that region. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Galloway, will talk about other areas, I think, a little <coughs> later on. One of the uh, concerns that I had about uh, the executive summary was uh, the sloppy scientific writing that occurred there in several places. Uh, for example, uh, one of the articles dealt with ozone damage to plants. And the report and the executive summary had reproduced a scientific figure that had an illustration that had appeared in Science Magazine. Well, I took the time 
to go back and check the original paper, paper published by Reich and Amundsen in 1985 in Science, to determine whether it had been reproduced faithfully or not, and I found that, in fact, it had not. Well, uh, I've been uh, expressing some of my concerns about the problems in the executive summary, and Congressman Dingell asked me to uh, identify them uh, fully, which I did to him in a letter of 14 November. That letter was passed on to the Environmental Protection Agency and the NAPAP uh, group. Three and a half months later, I received an answer. And the answer that I got to that particular question, which was a question about sloppiness of presentation of data, uh, was, and I quote, it is possible that the slope of the line for sugar maple may have been slightly steeper in figure 714 than in the original figure. However, this does not change the interpretation in the text, unquote. In other words, the numbers may be wrong, but the answer is still the same. As a scientist, that really bothers me in that the sloppiness that I was concerned about seems to be continuing. And even the answer that says it may be that the slope of the line was slightly different. Well, it can be determined exactly if it were or were not. Another example <coughs> that I would refer to <coughs> is that on page 10 of the executive summary, it was stated that man-made, quote, man-made acid rain has been present in the eastern United States since the turn of the century, unquote. On the 6th of October, 1987, Dr. Culp uh, reiterated this same statement in a debate with me on live television, the CNN network. In fact, there are no published data to provide direct support for the statement. There are published data that have been debated, argued about, and so forth that show that precipitation was not acid regionally prior to about 1930, in the eastern United States. The response that I got back, um, as I mentioned before, from uh, Mr. Thomas through Mr. Dingell uh, was, and I quote, the paragraph on which Dr. Likens has commented does not rely on either published or unpublished precipitation data. Rather, it is clearly an inference from the patterns of emissions described in that paragraph, unquote. I'd like to read that again, that the paragraph which Dr. Likens has commented does not rely on either published or unpublished data. Now in science, when you make a comment that relies neither on published nor unpublished data, what is it based on? Well, I don't know. It's an inference for sure, but when you make a statement in an executive summary that says man-made acid rain has been present in the eastern United States since before the turn of the century, that's a pretty powerful statement in an emotional, political context of which the acid rain issue is being debated. I suggest that is really bad science. The last point that I would make very quickly uh, refers to a precipitation map of pH that appeared on page 24 of the executive summary, and I suggest that it shows unrealistically high values, that is, less acid than I would have expected in the northeastern United States in 1985. And if you would indulge me, I would like to show this figure quickly. Any chance of dimming the yeah we're doing that right now. This is the uh, map that appeared on in the uh, executive summary of of the NAPAP assessment. It's for 1985. It's annual precipitation weighted pH, and the bullseye of this map, the 4.2, the lowest or the most acidic values are shown there, and they cover a small part of one, two, three, four, five states. And I was curious about this, so I went to our, our national monitoring network, which is the National Atmospheric Deposition Program data, 
And they had published a map for the same year, 1985, and I have plotted here their data. I have not extrapolated them, manipulated them, or done anything to them other than just plot them. And if you can see the darker, larger dots, those are the dots that have a pH of 4.2. And so the bullseye, in fact, covers 11 states. And if Congresswoman Snyder were still here, she would see that the bullseye covers her state in this map, but in the NAPAP assessment, it only covers that. Now, in terms of a report summarizing the information, I think it is quite clear that the difference in such a presentation clearly minimizes the effect. I have done nothing with those data other than show them to you. Let me quickly make a few concluding remarks. I think one of the major deficiencies in the assessment is the lack of consideration or evaluation of the relationship between pollutants. And that was referred to earlier this morning. Although these interactions are referred to in a few places, the report continually comes back to what I would call a reductionist discussion of one single factor at a time, rather than the combined stresses, which are what are affecting plants and lakes and humans uh, and other animals in the environment. That's what's really going on. That's what we have to understand. It's very difficult. And you're suggesting, I take it, that there's a synergistic relationship Absolutely. between these polluting effects, where Absolutely. the whole may be greater than the sum of the parts. And that's what we have more to understand. More dangerous and more polluting. Yes, sir. The, the assessment must, in my view, carefully evaluate that kind of interaction. The Concentrations of sulfates, for example, the, the relationship between sulfates and nitrates and ozone are important. The concentrations of sulfates alone, even though they have decreased uh, recently in the eastern United States, still are two to four times greater in rainfall than that thought to cause chemical and ecological change in sensitive aquatic ecosystems. If we add the dry deposition to that, then it is as much as four to six times greater than those acceptable levels. Relative to the, the lakes that um, have been affected or changed by acid precipitation, and this point that some have been acidified according to the assessment, in the most recent issue of Environmental Science and Technology, an article by David Brakey, Dixon Landers, and Joseph Eilers Eilers being uh, an employee of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, based upon this lake survey that you referred to earlier, Congressman, the last sentence in that uh, paper's abstract I would like to read to you, and I quote, the data collected during the Eastern Lake Survey support the hypothesis that regional lake acidification has occurred in the northeastern United States, unquote. That, I would suggest, is a very different kind of statement than the ones that we will find in the executive summary, which say some, maybe, possibly, might have, and so forth. As a scientist, um, I'm well aware of the use of the some, and maybe, and possibly, and might have. In fact, you have criticized me in the past for being a one-handed scientist, with on the one hand it might be, and on the other hand it might not be. But no, it's we, the one. It's the one-armed scientist that we're all looking for. Who doesn't <laughs> give us on the one hand. On the other hand, you're a two-handed scientist. I am. I am, and I agree. Um, but in fact, we do know a great deal about this problem. And my objection is that the executive summary does not state clearly what we do know and what we do not know. Uh, Dr. Likens, uh, we've been at this stand for a long time. This subcommittee. And uh, over the years, we had top scientific officials whom we respected, who had credibility from NCAR, for example, in Boulder, come in and say to us, even though we really wanted to do something, they said, we really don't know enough yet. We really don't know enough yet. 
And that went on for quite a few years. And they were giving us on the one hand, on the other hand. But you know, all that has changed. And the a responsible body of the scientific community now says, we don't need to do on the one hand, on the other hand, anymore. We have enough credible scientific evidence to indicate that a certain minimal level of remediation, of control efforts, are justifiable by the scientific evidence. And that we can do things that are sensible, uh, that uh, will enable industry to, to compete, uh, in, that are cost effective, and that we should get on with it. That now, as I understand it, and please correct me if, if I'm wrong, uh, is the consensus of the scientific committee, uh, community, and there has been a 180 degree uh, sea change uh, in the last uh, eight or ten years that we've been having hearings on this subject. It's, dif it's difficult to know what uh, the consensus of the scientific committee is, but in 1985, a group of colleagues and I took the time of going through six federal reports prepared by scientists to look for answers to questions that we ask. And a copy of that report is uh, attached with my testimony, and the, the title of it is, Is There Scientific Consensus? And it might be time to do that again, but the, the result of, of that look, not the answers we had, but the answers that were given in these other federal scientific reports was, yes, indeed, there is a lot of consensus. Uh, as I say, it might be time to do that, that again, because the ever-increasing amount of scientific information adds uh, more and more to this uh, knowledge base as we go along. Well, the perhaps it would be possible for the for you and your colleagues to do this kind of a reappraisal in the next uh, four months so that you might have some views to give us at about the same time that Dr. Mahoney is going to have some uh, rethinking and reappraisal to give us of that 35-page executive summary. There, there has been, in the meantime, an, uh, an additional report from the National Academy of Sciences and this NAPAP report, for example, which uh, adds a great deal of information. I'd like just to, to finally say that um, the scientists working in the NAPAP program are, are largely very good scientists, and they do largely very good scientific work. I think they deserve better than they got in the executive summary of that uh, assessment report. As a scientist, I feel badly that they didn't, that their work was not reported uh, carefully and accurately, and that's what I believe, that it was not. The other thing that I would like to say is that... Well, let, let me just say that I agree with you, and I think Dr. Mahoney agrees with you. I hope he does. And yes. uh, I hope he does, too, and I think he does. Uh, he, uh, as, uh, he is a loyal... Uh, uh, employee of this administration, but I detected that he was distancing himself from uh, many of the conclusions in that 35-page executive summary. And I suspect that one of the reasons he was doing it is, A, from his own hard knowledge as a professional and his many years, going back to 1982, of, of involvement in this area, and B, I think he's probably quite well aware that there's extraordinary dissatisfaction and resentment and unhappiness uh, in his own scientific advisory committee, and that there's a, a significant morale factor there as a result of the fact that they don't feel that their work was properly integrated and summarized in a fair, objective, and intelligent way in that report. And I think he's responding to their morale uh, problems as much as he is to his own knowledge that as far as that report was concerned, that executive report, something was rotten in Denmark. The last point that I would like to make is that um, I think the, the, the NAPAP started in 1980, but the research uh, really didn't yeah. begin until 1982. And in my opinion, it's unreasonable to think that all of the important answers are going to be achieved by 1990. Uh, when the program was set up as a 10-year program, that was a good target. But I think science doesn't work that way. There are always continuing questions and answers that, that, and revisions that are, that are required. So I would, I would like to suggest that oh, we, we should continue that program as necessary or some form of that program as necessary uh, and that we shouldn't put uh, limits, even though I'm very critical of the report that came out in 19, 
uh, or last fall, 1987, uh, that uh, this is a very complex issue and it is going to require uh, a, a continual look. And if we do apply uh, legislative regulations and controls, we have to monitor those as well and see how well they are doing. That's a part of the science continuing. Thank you, Dr. Likens. I've got to answer this roll call vote. We'll suspend for 15 minutes. We'll be back in just a few moments with the conclusion of this hearing on acid rain. Major events that air on C-SPAN are previewed in the C-SPAN Update, the network's weekly newspaper. The update gives you the big picture on the week through reports on programs we've scheduled in advance. Call 1-800-453-4000 and we'll send you 50 issues of the update for just $24. Order now and you'll receive a free gift, C-SPAN's Road to the White House poster. You can use your credit card or we'll be glad to send you a bill. Call now. Up next, the conclusion of Wednesday's hearing before the House Science, Space, and Technology Subcommittee on Natural Resources, Agricultural Research, and the Environment. That panel heard testimony on the National Acid Rain Research Program. Okay, uh, we have two more witnesses and we're really running late. So I'm going to ask the last two witnesses to, uh, it's now nine minutes of, to try and take five or six minutes, no more, to uh, summarize uh, their testimony and perhaps discuss their views on uh, the testimony that you heard from Dr. Mahoney and perhaps this extraordinary article on the front page of the Washington Post on uh, the U.S. negotiators in Geneva suggesting or demanding a right on the part of the United States to increase some uh, key ingredients of acid rain, a whopping 20 percent. So if you have any thoughts on that or on the Mahoney's testimony, uh, I'd welcome that. All right, Dr. Galloway, why don't you take your five or six minutes and then we'll go to Mr. Goffman. Thank you, Congressman. And of course, your, uh, your full statement will be printed in the record. Yes, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The purpose of today's hearing is to address the NAPAP 1985 assessment. I have several comments. They're outlined in my uh, testimony. I will, in the sake of time, I will condense my remarks to considering the state of knowledge about the acidification of surface waters in the southeastern United States. The NAPAP 1985 assessment uh, uh, stated... Excuse me, could you pull the mic a little bit closer to you? Thank you. The NAPAP 1985 assessment stated that there are no streams in the southern Blue Ridge province less than pH 6.0. Therefore, there are no sensitive streams in the area of the southeastern United States that they looked at sensitive to acidification. Does this mean that there are, in reality, no sensitive streams? No, it does not. The 1985 NAPAP assessment ignored a published study showing that the streams in Shenandoah National Park are extremely sensitive to acidification. I presented this material and testimony before a Senate subcommittee a year and a half ago, well in advance of the 85 assessment, and this was not contained in the 85 assessment. However, even if NAPAP did not address this issue or listen to these published facts, the Commonwealth of Virginia did. They supported a study to identify to investigate over 400 of the native trout, uh, brook trout streams in the state of Virginia, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. There are 450 identified native brook trout streams in the Commonwealth. My group has analyzed over 80 percent of these. The distribution of these streams is shown in the first figure attached to my testimony. They range all up and down the mountainous portions of the Commonwealth of Virginia. The conclusions from this study are the follows. 
78% of the sampled streams have alkalinity values less than 100 microcovins per liter, making them sensitive to acidification. 49%, about half, have alkal alkalinity values less than 50, making them very sensitive to acidification. 11% have alkalinities less than zero, meaning that they are now acidic and have probably become acidic in the last 10 years. 18% of the streams had pH values less than six. It's very fortunate that the Commonwealth of Virginia undertook this study, for if we'd relied on the NAPAP investigation from their pilot stream study, we would not have known this. And indeed, after seeing a draft version of the entire stream study from NAPAP, that study does not agree with the study of the Commonwealth of Virginia. The Commonwealth of Virginia has identified a much higher percentage of streams sensitive to acid deposition. It's not only Virginia that's of concern here, it's also other states with similar soils and geology and vegetation, including North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Maryland. After six years of research under NAPAP, is it true that, quote, we don't know, quote, is it true that there still exists a very large amount of scientific uncertainty so large amount that the official position of this administration is to take no action on the acid deposition issue. The executive summary of the 1985 assessment of NAPAP implies that it is true that we don't know and that there's a large amount of scientific uncertainty. That is a misrepresentation of the state of science. There have been four volumes published by the National Academy of Sciences refuting, or excuse me, uh, stating the impacts of acid deposition on aquatic ecosystems. We do know that acid deposition acidifies aquatic ecosystems. We do know that they are of large extent in not only northeast United States but the southeast United States. We do know that there are large segments of the biological populations at risk. It's my belief that the scientific community has essentially done its job, has accumulated enough information about aquatic ecosystems for, for the policymakers to stop the discussion about whether to reduce the emissions of sulfur nitrogen and to begin the discussion of how to reduce them. Thank you very much. Th uh, thank you very much, Dr. Galloway. Uh, Mr. Goff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will try to summarize my summary, if you will, to, in the interest of time. I'm an attorney on the staff of the Environmental Defense Fund. Could you pull that mic close sure. to you? I'm an attorney on the staff of the Environmental Defense Fund, where I work very closely with uh, my senior colleague, Dr. Michael Oppenheimer, a distinguished atmospheric physicist and an expert on acid deposition and its ecological impacts. Dr. Oppenheimer has reviewed the NAPAP assessment carefully and assisted in the preparation of my testimony, uh, particularly the written testimony. Uh, at the risk of being repetitious, I, I'd like to focus on the executive summary of the interim assessment released last fall, because it's bound to, it has had and it's bound to have a disproportionate impact on public debate and policy decision making with regard to acid rain control. Uh, that doesn't mean that I've been deaf this morning to the rather constructive suggestions that Dr. Mahoney has made about how the balance of the program should proceed. And I think the opening up of the assessment process will give us a chance at least to cure uh, some of the downright abuses that we saw on the executive summary of last fall. Uh, rather than go through uh, all of the problems that we have with the executive summary, let me just pull out one example uh, that suggests that the executive summary was not only uh, an inaccurate and distorting document, but that it was in fact uh, intentionally suborning a preconceived do nothing or no action agenda and was not distilling or summarizing scientific found findings. In my view, at least, the most revealing part of the executive summary was its treatment of the ground level ozone problem. Uh, in order to demonstrate that sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen are not responsible for observed crop and forest damage, the assessment argued strenuously, I should say the executive summary argued strenuously that ground level regional ozone is the one true culprit of any damage that there is to forests and crops. First of all, this either or approach to individu individual pollutants is, as Dr. Likens testified, contradicted by the underlying scientific research 
that is part of the NAPAP program itself. But more significantly, despite the executive summary's own arguments that ozone is the problem, the summary studiously managed to avoid concluding that ozone should be controlled, even though that is the unavoidable logic of its own position. Instead, the assessment or the executive Trump summary dropped its cloak of scientific analysis and made a blatant policy judgment, stating that controlling the precursors of ozone would be either too expensive or technologically infeasible. Yet, even uh, in that uh, assertion... Excuse me, I didn't hear that. Could you go back a sentence and sure. pull the mic closer? I'm See sorry about that. Speak right into the mic. Uh, not... In, instead, of, instead of accepting the, the logical inevitability that if, grant, that if regional ozone is, is the culprit in causing crop and forest damage uh, and concluding, as logic would dictate, that the real answer here is to control ozone, uh, the assessment or the executive summary uh, discounted that possibility and stepping back or stepping away from its uh, obligation to give a scientific assessment, it made a policy judgment very blatantly and said, we just don't have, we just can't afford or we don't have the technological wherewithal to control the precursors of ozone. And even that assertion is not true. It's belied by the evidence that's readily available about the availability of uh, ozone precursor control technology and the affordability of that technology. It's being used here in the States, it's being used in Japan, it's being used in Western Europe. Uh, so there was a dual problem there. Uh, the assessment abandoned its role as, as providing, uh, or the executive summary abandoned its role of providing a summary of a scientific assessment and went right after policy judgments. And in, that, in having done that, it made a bad policy judgment. And I think that is a typical of the problem that the executive summary presents um, to the public debate on what we should do about controlling acid rain. Uh, again, I think that some of the comments that Dr. Mahoney made um, were very encouraging because uh, I think he's going to give the broader scientific and policy making community a bigger role in the next round of assessments that are being uh, undertaken. Well, specifically, I think uh, he indicated that the Interagency Scientific Committee, which was supposed to not only review it, but give it peer review, uh, would be playing that kind of function. Well, I agree with you. I was encouraged, too. But, you know, those of us who are very concerned about the issue have to be particularly vigilant to make sure that we take full advantage of that opportunity. Uh, Go ahead. The other point that I want to make, and this is... Uh, to introduce a, a new factor that I don't even think NAPAP considered, uh, is a couple of days ago, my scientific colleagues at the Environmental Defense Fund uh, released uh, what is perhaps a breakthrough study uh, that culminated two years of research on the role of acid deposition in the pollution of coastal waters. Uh, what my colleagues concluded is that acid rain is one of the chief sources of excessive nitrogen loadings in coastal waters and estuaries in the east. Uh, thus, by stimulating the overgrowth of oxygen hoarding algae, airborne nitric deposition, a constituent of acid rain, is contributing to the choking off of our coastal marine habitats, which are the very nurseries of our oceans. Now, this is an issue that I don't believe the NAPAP study has considered at all to date. And it's particularly ir ironic that two days after the release of the study, uh, the U.S. negotiating position in Geneva uh, is to ask for an increase in the nitrogen constituents uh, of acid rain emissions or acid rain precursors. Um, frankly, I think that that makes the diplomatic position that we reported this morning in the Post almost absurd. Thank you very much, Mr. Goffman. Uh, Uh, Mr. Goffman, why was it that uh, NAPAP didn't discover the link between acid deposition and nitrate loadings in mid-Atlantic estuaries? I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but I can speculate that it may have just been a bureaucratic one, that the staff at EPA that, that's looking at estuaries uh, just was not included in the loop 
of uh, scientific consideration. Uh, any of you who wish to answer, the executive summary uh, contains no discussion of the acid deposition falling on the northeastern United States or Canada. And um, they stated that better information <coughs> will be had when the regional acid deposition model is completed. Do we truly lack credible information on the sources of acid rain in these areas? Uh, you like yes or no answers. <laughs> this answer is no, we don't lack that information. We have. We know what the sources are. We know what the direct effects on aquatic ecosystems are. We know the degree of transport. It was interesting, the executive summary, that there was no mention of Canada. We know that. Um, it's also interesting that they didn't mention the fact that, that there's scientific certainty, as the previous panel pointed out, scientific certainty, that there is a large amount of transport from the U.S. to Canada. The net flow goes north. There was not one mention of that in the executive summary. Uh the executive summary said they didn't include uh, Canada because the uh, because of the science because of the uncertain quality of the data, and uh, Dr. Mahoney said they didn't include the Canadian data because of the non-comparability of that data. Uh, my impression is that the Canadians know what they're doing when it comes to science, and particularly when it comes to the science of investigating and measuring and testing for acid rain, in which they have a tremendous uh, national interest. Uh, do you find that a credible statement on the part of, uh, this is for any of you, do you find a credible statement on the part of uh, the, uh, the EPA in its executive summary that the uncertain quality of the data, or as Dr. Mahoney called it, the uh, non-comparability of the data, would have uh, forced its exclusion from the executive summary, that enormous body of data uh, that, uh, delineating and documenting uh, uh, damage and impacts astronomically uh, in excess of ours, of an order of magnitude that we, don't, we have never experienced in this country. Uh, I don't understand that statement at all. Uh, there are some absolutely outstanding scientists in Canada, aquatic and terrestrially oriented scientists that have published papers on this issue in some of the uh, most prestigious scientific journals in the world. Um, and to say that uh, uh, all the Canadian data is suspect, if that's the intent of, of uh, the, the uh, comment that we heard this morning, just makes no sense to me whatsoever. In, in all of science, as in all of uh, any walk of life, there are high quality results and there are less than high quality results. But that's why we have a peer review system that tries to sort all that out. But uh, there, there are some very distinguished Canadian scientists that have worked on this problem and have published on this problem. And it makes no sense to me to ignore those data. The interim assessment uh, suggests that research suggests that most watersheds in the Northeast are at or near a steady state, implying that few of any of the lakes will become more acidic in the near future. Does this uh, statement represent a consensus in the scientific community on this subject? Uh, not at all. Uh, I commented on this in my prepared uh, testimony. Uh, the, the idea of a steady state uh, in terms of an ecological system is a very complex issue. What uh, they're purporting to talk about here is a steady state relative to sulfur deposition and sulfur uh, retention in water bodies. Uh, but the issue here is much more complicated than that. And uh, again, it's, it's, it's the more basic or the more fundamental problem uh, is that it's looking for a, a single factor kind of solution to a very complex problem. And it's just, uh, nature unfortunately doesn't work that way. Um, but there are many examples of which um, it appears that the sulfur system is not in steady state at all in the northeastern United States. Uh, and this is kind of a broad brush look at um, sulfur inputs and retention and losses from lakes 
that I don't think there's any general agreement on at all. I think it's a, it's a major problem in the assessment that needs to be looked at in the next two years and evaluated carefully. All right. Uh, I want to thank you for your uh, splendid testimony. Uh, it's uh, sometimes been said in reference to your answer, Dr. Likens, that for every very complicated question, there's always a very simplistic answer, and it's invariably wrong. I think we have a dramatic case of that in the present time. Uh, you've been very patient. You've been uh, very forthcoming and have given us thoughtful testimony. And we thank you very much. Uh, we may have some questions for you, and we're going to hold open the record uh, for 10 or 12 days uh, to submit further questions by mail. Thank you very much for coming. The meeting is adjourned. You've been watching a hearing on acid rain held before the House Science, Space, and Technology Subcommittee on Natural Resources, Agricultural Research, and the Environment. To contact that panel, you may write to 388 House Annex 2, Washington, D.C., 20515. The C-SPAN update can be helpful if you want to better plan your C-SPAN viewing. The update is the weekly newspaper of America's network and details many of the major events we cover. Call 1-800-321-5.